that's my worst year that it's six weeks today, and then what the hell happened? Yeah, it's Okay. Out with the old and with the new. <laughs> no. It won't. It won't turn off. I need to do a the of the slides and the answers. And I don't think they have one on the whole space. I have not I lost my brain. I have to really back. I have to I lost my brain. I have to I lost my brain. I have Good morning. We got about 10 minutes before we're starting, and I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. The best seats are up front here. The best seats are in the front. You can see people wiggle in their chairs and roll their eyes and all kinds of stuff. So.
Five minutes, five minutes. And like I said, the best seats are up front here. We're getting close. Are we good back there, Kenny? All right. We're going to start on time which is amazing in it, all by itself. Good morning. Welcome to the Pipeline Safety Trust Conference 2022. We've had a couple of years off because of COVID. My name's Bill Karam. I'm the executive director of the Pipeline Safety Trust. Um, I've just got a few slides. Oh, look, and they even have my slides live. These guys are great. Just a few slides. I want to welcome everybody to New Orleans. We have a full house today. There's a few seats up front here if people don't want to stand in the back. I'm um, really appreciating everybody being here. Uh, I thought this slide was appropriate because uh, I wasn't supposed to be up here speaking this morning, but like a bad, whoops, now my slides aren't live. <laughs> what happened to the slides? They worked a second ago. Uh, I knew the technical stuff would catch up with us. Let's try it again. There we go. There's the funny slide I was trying to show you. Um, I wasn't supposed to be here, but I am. So like a bad penny, uh, he's returned from the dead. Uh, I just have a few slides to go through some initial stuff, and then we're going to he hear from the real Bill Karam. Um, just some emergency preparedness things. The bathrooms are just right out. The men's is right there and the women's is around the corner. Um, exits are clearly marked. There's stairs right out there in case something happens. You can go out there and either out the garage or out the front door to get away from the building. Uh, lunch, you know, I have the marked here. The lunch is going to be an exchange place, which is a new facility. The the uh, hotel has, which is downstairs, around the corner, down the hall, out the garage, past an alley into a little uh, pink building. Um, and if that sounds too complicated, they're going to have hotel staff all the way along the way to herd us, I guess. So uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, both the reception this evening and the breakout room for the other breakouts is just around the corner downstairs and down the hallway too, and there'll be people kind of directing your way there. And there is Wi-Fi in the room, and there's the uh, Wi-Fi network and the password. It's also written on the back of your name tag if you're looking for that. We're trying something new this year, which I was skeptical of because I'm an old guy and I'm used to doing things old ways. But we didn't have any packets this year. We're trying to save paper and trees and all that good stuff. CO2, cutting down our carbon footprint. Um, so yeah, there's two QR codes on the back of your name tag, too. One will take you right to the... Um, 
agenda and the other one takes you to kind of a link tree that has a bunch of different links of information that relates to what you're going to hear about the next couple days. Um, so that's one thing we're doing. I thought I would, uh, I, I stole this, this famous risk management slide that I think a, a, a past chairman of the NTSB came and showed us one time about how hazards slip through the Swiss cheese and end up causing an accident. Well, it's kind of the same way when you look at how some of us got here this year. You know, we managed to slip through the cheese for COVID, slip through for snow, slip through for tornadoes. At least that was my trip here. And we all ended up here. So congratulations. As a hazard, you made it through the Swiss cheese and we're all here enjoying New Orleans. Um, these sessions are being webcast live, both in here and the other room, and they'll also be archived on our website um, that you can, so you can listen to them afterwards. Also, anybody that's listening on the webcast can ask us questions, and there's an email address, questions at pstrust.org. So if you're listening from afar, welcome, and you can send us questions, and there's three of us in the room that will get those right on our cell phones, and we'll ask them if we have time. I thought people would like to know a little bit about who's in the room. And this is the North America map of where we're all from. And it's pretty filled out this year. It's pretty amazing when you look at uh, where people have come from. So it really is not only a national effort, it's kind of a North American effort. Well, quite a few people from north of the border this year and more provinces re represented than normal. And here's kind of a breakout of who's in the room just from you know, we always talk about the three-legged stool of the public, the industry, and regulators. And this is a, that breaks it out a little more. And for the first time ever, you know, the public interest people are at the top. Um, now, that's not totally true, because if you add up the next three numbers, it's uh, we're, we're still kind of outnumbered a little bit. But, but it, we're really happy to see so many public interest folks along with the industry and the regulators today. The Pipeline Safety Trust does not take money from the industry. So why am I showing you all these industry logos? Well, we do take money from the industry for only one purpose, and that is to help pay people to participate in pipeline safety discussions. So the logos that are up there are folks that have given us money to help get people here. So if you're an activist that doesn't like pipelines and we help pay your way here, chances are that's coming from one of these companies. So try to process that in your head for a while. And kind of one of the last things I wanted to say is this conference is pretty unique. I go to a lot of conferences and you go to an industry conference and it's all industry people talking to industry people. And you go to an activist conference and it's an activist talking to activists. So it's really kind of fish bowls listening to each other talk. We really have tried to make this conference different where there's lots of different perspectives talking to each other and trying to come up with safety solutions. You know, and it's really, uh, you know, one thing I always say at this conference is we really try to keep our blinders on focused on pipeline safety, although, you know, where that starts and stops is different for different people. And, you know, it's fine to disagree. We know there's going to be people that disagree in here, but you can disagree without being disagreeable. It's kind of my saying, so uh, keep that in mind. So I just wanted to thank you, and we're going to actually hear from the real Bill Karam now, if we can get the tech to work, because he came down with COVID on Monday, which was his birthday, for God's sakes. Um, and I got the call Monday morning saying, guess what, Carl? Because um, I retired three years ago, and you can see how well that worked. So here comes Bill. Good morning, everyone. I have been planning this conference in one way or another, really since I started at the Pipeline Safety Trust in 2020. And I can honestly say, in all of the different scenarios I dreamt of, not one of them involved all of you sitting in the ballroom in uh, the Hotel Monteleone in New Orleans, and me sitting in my home office here in Bellingham recording a greeting to you, sick with COVID. But here we are. I can't fully express how disappointed I am to not be there in the room with you all today, but I am incredibly grateful and proud of our team of staff and board members uh, who will ensure that this um, conference is a success. Our board president, Beth Wallace, will soon introduce those board members and staff members to you. Um, but before that, I just want to take a moment and recognize our business manager, Heather Radke who has been tirelessly working on the planning and logistics of this conference. She is a true rock star and we could not have done this without you. 
Thank you, Mary. During the 2019 conference, and I was able to watch it over the live stream, I was really inspired by the ability and willingness of advocates and stakeholders to um, express their passions and their positions while seemingly able to hear and understand the, the positions and passions of those that were different from theirs. Um, people at this conference really seem to be able to talk to each other and not just past each other. And I'm humbled and honored to continue that tradition. And speaking of inspiration, we have a room full of inspiring pipeline safety leaders in the room today. Uh, we are so lucky to soon hear from the 15th chair of the NTSB, the Honorable Jennifer Homendy, and tomorrow we'll hear from Deputy Administrator Tristan Brown. <clears throat> we also have some inspiring public and tribal advocates in the room today as well. We have uh, Jane Klebb with Bold Alliance, Chief Shackley with the New Age Indian Band, Richard Asakin from the CalSS First Nation, Carolyn Raffensperger with the Science and Environmental Health Network, Dante Swinton from CL, and Aaron Murphy from EDF. We also have the author of the Gassing Satarsha article that seemingly single-handedly changed the uh, national dialogue on CO2 pipelines, uh, Dan Zegar. We also have a special guest with us for the conference, Debrea or Diemaris Burns, a survivor of that pipeline failure who was featured in Dan's article. We're lucky to also have some strong industry pipeline safety leadership in the room today. We have um, uh, Sean Lyon with MPLX, Andy Drake of Enbridge, Dave Merck from API, Christina Sames with AGA, John Studi with LIPA, and Ben Kochman with INGA. I have learned so much from all of you in my first few years here, and I'm really grateful you're at the conference. We also have strong government leadership here today, in addition to the keynote speakers I mentioned earlier, Alan Mayberry, the Associate Administrator for Pipeline Safety at FIMSA, Linda Doherty, the Deputy Associate Administrator at FIMSA, uh, Mark Paws with the Canadian Energy Regulator, John Wolfgram, the Chair of NAPSER, and Mary Friend, the immediate past Chair of NAPSER. I apologize to those of you whom I missed, um, but I wanted to be sure that I recognize some of you who have inspired, uh, mentored, or helped me in my first few years at the Pipeline Safety Trust. Taking over from Carl has been quite the endeavor. Um, every day, the shoes I'm trying to fill seem to get bigger, um, but I am truly grateful for the legacy he has built, and I'm honored to continue it. But thanks to our wonderful staff and board and many of you in this room, I feel like I'm also helping to create a new chapter at the Pipeline Safety Trust. Um, with the moral bedrock of the pipeline, of the Bellingham tragedy supporting us, um, we're able to continue our traditional work on natural gas and hazardous liquid pipeline safety, and also advocate for safety in newly important areas like LNG, CO2 pipelines, and hydrogen pipelines. We're also here to ensure that the necessary energy transition is done so equitably and safely. But these aren't the only changes uh, we've had at the Pipeline Safety Trust. We've had a change in board leadership as well. After four years uh, as board president, Sarah Gossman hit her term limit. I wanna thank Sarah for her tremendous leadership and mentorship for my first few years here at the Trust. And I'm grateful that she is still on the board and um, part of our executive committee. And I wanna welcome our new board president, Beth Wallace, um, a fierce pipeline safety advocate uh, who has been a true delight to work with. Beth's day job, she protects the Great Lakes with the National Wildlife Federation. And I want to invite her up to the podium to say a few words now. Enjoy the sessions today, everyone. I truly wish I was there with you and welcome Beth. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Carl. And I want to take a moment to congratulate Bill and the staff for bringing us all together in such important topics during a challenging time in our history with an energy system undertaking urgent changes as we scramble to address a climate crisis. 
As you'll hear throughout these next two days, sometimes urgency can bring more harm than good, especially to BIPOC communities and nations that have already been forced to absorb the destruction of our energy systems. Bill has done a tremendous job leading this organization during this time of urgency and transition, even during the best of times. This is not an easy role to fill, especially following in Carl's footsteps. Bill came to the trust right before COVID hit and looked, uh, looking back on his accomplishments over the past two years, we have no doubt that Bill is setting up the trust to meet the challenges head on. And thank you to Carl for continuing your life's work while you sort through what it means to be retired. <laughs> We also really appreciate all of you taking the time from your work and your families to be here. It is great to finally be back together again and an honor to be here as the board chair. The trust has undertaken amazing growth over the last two years and I'm excited to showcase a glimpse of that work as well as introduce you to everyone on the staff and the board. Uh, in the last two years, we've commissioned a white paper on CO2 pipeline risks and regulatory gaps that has driven national dialogue on CO2 pipeline safety. We've grown from a staff of three to eight, expanding our capacity and expertise. We also have new data storytelling, which can be seen on our state website transparency review. And we have upcoming data dashboard that will be featured in the session uh, today or tomorrow on how data can be informed, can inform pipeline safety. That, um, that storytelling will also be showcased in upcoming briefing papers. The Trust has also commissioned a white paper on hydrogen pipeline safety that will help to save lives as the incentives from recent legislation uh, is implemented. And hot off the press, you can find that report at pstrust.org uh, on our website. Finally, I'm excited to share the board has uh, passed and expanded our climate resolution to ensure that our work and advocacy centers around the need for urgent climate action, supporting a just clean energy future. All of this work wouldn't be possible without the growing team at the Trust. As I call your name, please take a moment to stand and say hello. Start with the staff. Uh, you all met Carl. Rebecca? Uh, Heather is in the back, I believe. I think I saw Heather. Um, let's see here. Aaron, our policy council. Amanda, our program manager. James, our data manager. In the back. And then Kenny. I know you all have probably seen many, 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 many emails from Kenny. We appreciate that, Kenny, our communications and outreach director. Please give them all a round of applause for the work. Now I'd like to introduce the board, starting with Bruce. Where did Bruce Peter go? And Lois. Hey, Lois. I have assignments for you, by the way. Come find me. Bob. Glenn. And then unable to join us is our former chair, Sarah Gosman, as well as our vice chair, Jeff Ingsco. I know I speak for the board and staff when I say we look forward to being with all of you in these next few days. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I do wanna encourage everyone here to take advantage of this time together. This is a remarkably unique opportunity and I challenge you to uh, think about different perspectives and assumptions, so ask hard questions and to be open to conversations. And I hope to see you all at the reception this evening. Okay, enough from me. I'm excited to and honored to introduce our keynote for uh, this morning's session. Before I get too formal with her introduction, I do want to share a quick personal story about the first time that I met Chairman Hamadine. Um, following the 2010 spill in Michigan, uh, my congressman, Congressman Schauer, who represented the home district at the time, was working with Jennifer to put together the oversight hearing for that event. And uh, it was during that event that I got to know you. And from the moment I've met her, and I know many of, of the folks from the community met you, it was clear you had passion and you were committed. You were committed to working through the problems that we experienced during that event. It, you have become a lifelong friend to several folks and we really appreciate the work that you have done. Uh, her commitment to understanding that event and helping the people affected and holding accountability, it was heroic. 
and it is heroic. It is no, no surprise that she now leads the agency that is instrumental in moving safety efforts forward. I personally want to thank you for your commitment and your life's work on this issue. Jennifer was sworn in as the 15th chair of the National Transportation Safety Board in August of 21, after being nominated by President Biden and unanim unanimously confirmed by the Senate. She has served as the 44th board member uh, of the NTSB and the fourth woman to serve as the chair for the agency. Woohoo! Since 1967, only four. <laughs> Many of us got to know Jennifer as a pipeline safety champion for her from her time on the Capitol. She spent 15 years in the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. There she has led oversight investigations, the nation's pipelines hazardous material safety program, and has worked with NTSB recommendations uh, and le through legislation with much success. As a small sample of her work, Jennifer helped shape the laws that led to improvements on leak detection, mitigation, emergency response, including the installation of excess flow valves uh, and distribution pipelines. Chairman Hamadine continues to be a fierce advocate for pipeline safety, and we're delighted to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Well, I didn't know I'd start off crying. Jeez. Oh, so good. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be here, and I'm going to have to just uh, warn you ahead of time. In all of New Orleans, they don't have a note card that is bigger than three by five. And I don't like to read from speeches, so I just turned 51 and I can't actually see what I wrote. <laughs> this is going to be great. Um, no, thank you to Carl and Virtual Bill if you're out, if, if you're out there. And uh, Certainly, Beth, who has become a wonderful friend, and so many friends uh, in this audience uh, that I just, too many that I, I can't name you all, Alan, Linda, I mean, Sean, so, so many uh, that I'm sure I would miss most of you. I see Lois back there and Bruce, and I'm just really honored to be here. I've worked with the Pipeline Safety Trust for nearly two decades and just really honored. I know Tristan is not here yet. I think he's speaking tomorrow, so please uh, send him my regards as well. Uh, all of you, every single one of you listed on that list, whether you're a public interest group, you're with a pipeline operator, who are the union members? I saw five. Oh, oh way more than five. That's great because my background, actually, I used to work with the AFL-CIO and for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. So I still count you as brothers and sisters. So I'm very excited that you are here. Uh, but uh, you're all vital safety partners, government as well. And I'm just really honored to be here. I do want to take a moment uh, to recognize uh, two people who are with me here. Uh, from the NTSB, Eric Strickland, who serves as executive officer, uh, number two in the agency uh, for the NTSB, and Kim West, who is one of our uh, pipeline safety investigators. There she is back there. I stole her from Alan. We stole her from Alan. Thank you, Alan. We have more to steal from you, and I'm going to get in. <laughs> get a, we're hiring, so please come work for us. We're going to talk about that. So I have to tell you, I'm not only am I excited to be here to talk about pipeline safety and um, uh, talk about our my priorities now that I'm chair of the NTSB, but I have to say I, my first ever keynote in my entire life, because when you're a congressional staffer, you serve as panels and you do, you know, Q&As, was actually at this event in 2018. And I didn't quite appreciate that it was a keynote. And so, Car you know, Carl introduces me and he makes this big deal about how this is her first ever keynote. And I'm standing right there and I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm here to talk about the NTSB and I've been here for a month. I mean, I know that I know what the NTSB did, certainly from my 14 years of working on the Hill, but I really needed a little bit more time. So when I got this invitation, I'm like, hell yeah, this is my time to get better. 
So very excited. I do want to start off talking about my vision for the NTSB. And the reason why I think that's so important before I talk about safety is because I think the vision for the NTSB benefits you. And that's what I want to talk about because I'm also going to ask you for, for some help as well. Uh, and, you know, th this it's interesting because when you're a board member of the NTSB, you're not running the agency. As chair, I'm also running the agency in addition to all my advocacy work out in the field. Um, and before I, I came to, before I became chair, uh, when I was nominated as chair between that time and the actual swearing in, I took some time, and I'm really thankful that I was at the agency for three years because I developed relationships internally over those three years. But I really wanted to take some time uh, to meet with the staff of the agency, not just chiefs, not just directors and deputies, but really the rank and file to figure out what, not, I didn't want to hear what we were doing right. I knew what we were doing right. I wanted to hear what we were doing wrong, where can I help improve, and how can I help them in my time at the agency? Because my job is to serve the agency and to serve the public, but first and foremost, to give uh, our agency personnel what they need to succeed, which also helps all of you succeed. And so it was a really, uh, uh, it, it started off, each, each conversation started off the same way. I laid this out and they would, they, I would say, so let's, let's talk about that. And they would look at me and say, you don't know what you want to be your vision of the agency? And it was so funny because I thought I, they panicked for a second. Like I was asking, yes, I knew, but maybe I was wrong. And I needed to hear from them what they needed. So I received a lot of uh, positive feedback, but I, again, I wanted to know what, uh, what we weren't doing right. And I wanna talk about that for a second. It all came down to, my, my vision can be summed up in two words, and that's mission first for our agency. Uh, mission first. We have, to, and that means if we're doing something that is successful, that works for our agency, we should continue doing it and doing it better. If not, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and, and I am going to talk about that a little bit more. But first and foremost, I, I do want to say no one is more critical uh, to our agency than our personnel. The NTSB is a world-renowned investigation agency and world-renowned for improving safety uh, since 1967 because of our people. Our people are our greatest asset. And so when I looked across the agency when I became chair, I realized we have 415 people in our agency. And I want to give you some perspective there because we're here talking about pipeline safety. But we do marine safety. We do highway and transit grade crossings. We do rail pipeline and hazardous materials across all modes. We do aviation safety and not just some aviation. We are mandated to do every civil aviation accident in the United States. And last year we did almost 450 foreign accidents in addition to that. It's a huge mandate for 415 people. That's what we have. When I came in as chair, we had 397 with 59 vacancies. That is huge for our agency. That is a big, big hole in the agency. And so I challenged the agency to begin to fill those vacancies. Eventually, I put in uh, leadership, career leadership. I chose uh, that as a uh, uh, for an agency, it should be headed, yes, I'm chair, yes, we have some politicals, but for the agency day-to-day -day operations, I could have chosen a political. I needed to have somebody who is an experienced career person at the NTSB, and so I chose Dana Schultz, who ran our Office of Aviation Safety. She's incredibly data-driven, uh, sometimes <laughs> a little too much, <laughs> which is great. Um, uh, she will go on about data for hours, uh, but she's phenomenal for our agency. Because when I came in, the answer was, wow, we can't possibly fill 59 vacancies so fast. Why not? Well, because we've never done that before. 
And that's, that's probably the worst thing to say to me because I'm going to challenge you to say, well, let's figure out why we haven't done that before. What could we be doing better? How do we do that? What do you need from me? And so uh, when I looked at that level of roughly 400 people, I then asked what has been our agency personnel going back decades. We have the same number of personnel today that we had in 1998. Think about that. You know, there may be less aviation crashes, but there's a whole lot more government mandates and a lot more that we have to do in other modes. We have millions of highway crashes on our roads. 43,000 people die annually on our roads. And so when you think about that, uh, just our mandate alone, we need more. We need more personnel. And we do. And the only reason it's not 456 today is because we're facing the same thing all of you are facing, which is mass retirement after COVID. 30% of our workforce is retirement eligible. They could walk out the door tomorrow. 30%. That is a lot. And so, uh, um, you know, uh, and I'm going to tell you pipelines because I'm going to try to steal some people from Alan. Maybe I'll try to steal Alan. Uh, so <laughs> Linda's like, oh, I'll take you, Linda, too. Uh, so um, we have four pipeline investigators. Four. We have some human performance people. We have some uh, other technical people. We have a director. We have an, uh, a deputy director. Four pipeline investigators. That's not going to work. Um, you know, when I look at my, our pipeline mandate, we have to, we are mandated by Congress to investigate everything involving a fatality, substantial property damage, and significant injury to the environment. We haven't been able to keep up with that mandate. In 2021, we had 65 accidents we were required to investigate that we weren't able to. Does that mean it doesn't get investigated? No, FIMSA looks into those. Certainly, and a wonderful partnership there. But we can't always rely on, on you know, FIMSA to have the resources too. We are partners, but we have to do what we're required to do. And so we will actually, just so folks know, we are going to have a notice of proposed rulemaking out uh, this year defining substantial property damage and defining significant injury to the environment. We have never done that. It has been subjective. We need to do that through an open rulemaking that, it, that is open uh, for public comment. And so that is coming. But four, and I want to talk to you about how four pipeline investigators affects each of you. I mean, they're spread thin. They have cases. That means they aren't able to do some investigations we, are, we should be doing. That means reports get delayed. You all want, uh, yes, when we do an investigation, the operator and others who are parties to our investigation know what happened. Thankfully, we have some info share opportunities, some safety sharing opportunities with others. But you want to know what we found, and you don't want to wait two, three, four years for that. And we had a number of pipeline accidents that were three, four years old. That is not acceptable for us. Not for me. That becomes irrelevant then. Uh, because change has started to happen by that time. And so uh, what, what, I, uh, what I did do is state that anything over two years as a, as, at a certain moment was going to be stripped of recommendations, stripped of findings, and we were going to issue the report to get it out. And from now going forward, it will not be more than two years. I mean, I'd love to say one, but that really pushes people and I can't do that. I can't burn out personnel and not, and not have the right solutions and the right uh, information. But it's, it's unfortunate that we had to do that with those pipeline investigations, but we have to get it out uh, to the public and going forward, we're gonna be doing a better job. When I took over our aviation accidents, were, we had a backlog of 457 that were three, four years old. Today, we're at 57. So it's not just, you know, my job at the agency is not to just go, 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 finish it. It's to create a process, to streamline the process, and uh, to set uh, the agency uh, for success going in the future, long after I've gone, so that they have a process that those 
those reports are issued in a more timely manner. So that will help each of you, whether it's industry, labor, public safety advocates, to understand what went on, what happened following a terrible tragedy, and what solutions that we recommend. Um, so number one is filling those vacancies. Um, I've requested the largest budget increase for the NTSB that has probably ever been requested because if you don't ask, nobody's gonna give it to you. So we are at a budget of 129.3 million for fiscal year uh, 23. And I am asking for 145, not a lot, for fiscal year 24 to help us get up our numbers on our personnel. At this point, we should be well over 500. And it's not just a head count, but it's also getting them the right training. We've had a big focus on external training in the past several years. Um, our training center is closing. Uh, that was well, it, our lease is up. So that'll come internally, but we're still gonna be providing some training, the modes will do that. But we're gonna really focus on internal training. And I'll tell you what's really important about that. There's a lot of new technology across all modes of transportation. Whether we're talking automated vehicles on our roads, electric vehicles, you know, lithium ion batteries in vehicles, we're talking about you know, leak detection new technologies. We talked about geohazards and uh, you know, new methods of inspection, and there's discussion of modernizing pipeline safety regulations, which is not a bad thing, but all of that has to be anchored in safety. And so we have to be ready. We have to be ready as the world leader in accident investigations to keep pace with rap uh, all these rapid changes in technology, and our folks are the best of the best but I wanna make sure they get the support they need to do their job. So what this means is the NTSB sent up its first ever uh, reauthorization proposal. Uh, if you are not familiar with how agencies get funded, there's the annual appropriations process, but then you need permission to get funded from the authorizing committee, the transportation committee who I used to work for. And we are right now not authorized. And so we sent up a reauthorization proposal requesting more resources, request, requesting more help uh, for our personnel, more training, and anything you can do to help us, because that's going to be up next year, would be greatly appreciated. Because if our folks are able to do their jobs well, that benefits each of you and would really appreciate your help. And it's, every, it's not just... Again, it's not just personnel, it's our lab equipment. It's making sure you all are able to search in a searchable, a, 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 I, I've had a thing about our, 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 our uh, technology, I'm not very good at it, but our technology uh, for accident reporting. It's so hard to find our reports online. I have tried many times and have failed, and I am the chair. So we are in the process of uh, uh, revamping that as well. But those all benefit you. In addition, I'm not looking for just input internally. I'm looking for input, input exter externally. Again, I know what we're doing right. I want to know what we're doing wrong, and you shouldn't be afraid to say it. I think those opportunities to tell me what, and for Pete's sake, if I'm doing something wrong, definitely tell me. Because I, that only makes me better. That only, I mean, we may not always agree, but it makes our agency better. It makes me better at doing my job. And I appreciate the candid feedback. Um, recently, I asked a question to the short line railroads in a public forum, and they gave me an answer, and I was totally shocked. I was like, you don't support that. So afterwards, I called the president and said, what happened? He said, oh, I thought, that's the quite, I thought that was the answer you wanted to hear. Do not give me that. I do not want the answer I want to hear. I want you to be very candid with us because I do want to improve. I serve our folks internally, but I also serve each of you, and that's my job. And I take that very seriously. On June 24th, we had a, uh, a stakeholder meeting uh, to begin that process. We're going to have more. That was the first of many. And I appreciate everyone who uh, dis, uh, participated in that. We're gonna have a separate one with FIMSA and others. Uh, but, uh, and if you're not on that list, let us know. Eric uh, can, can help take your information. 
because I do, uh, again, want that honest feedback. Now, I want to kind of transition from begging for your help uh, <laughs> internally uh, to some discussion about external um, pipeline safety issues. Um, Beth uh, talked about how passionate I am on pipeline safety. I am very passionate. I'm also half Italian, so that just comes with who I am. Um, and uh, and uh, you know the pipeline uh, pipeline uh, at a recent at two recent events uh, I from the pipeline industry they I was described as tough I am but fair also I am I um I am tough and uh, but I am fair we have to work together in order to improve safety uh, and, and I've taken that really to heart at the NTSB because when we do accident investigations. Uh, it's really all the parties together working together to improve safety, including operators, including public safety advocates. And uh, so we all have to work together uh, to get to an end goal of, of zero. And I do believe that's possible. Um, so uh, I am often asked what keeps me up at night when, when I go to events. And what keeps me up at night is the next family that I have to talk to after a terrible tragedy. And I want to talk about one that will forever, and it's not pipeline related. Uh, I, I purposely chose one not pipeline related, but it is one that will forever stay in my heart. Uh, a few years ago, 2019, there was a, a fire uh, that erupted on a uh, dive boat. A group went out uh, for a three-day excursion off Santa Cruz Island. Uh, it was just, you know, families who had booked a three-day fun diving event. For, uh, they went out and at three o'clock in the morning while uh, their equipment was, they had a lot of lithium-ion batteries. We, we could not completely draw uh, conclusions to that because it was completely burned down. Um, but a lot of lithium-ion battery equipment from the diving operations and photography that was charging in uh, the deck above them called the salon. And they, uh, there were 39, 39 people on board, five personnel uh, sleeping at three o'clock in the morning, which they should have been doing in the wheelhouse. There was supposed to be a roving patrol. There was not. Uh, so 33 passengers below deck and a uh, the very new worker who uh, were, should have been the roving patrol were asleep. And a fire broke out in that middle level and uh, they tried to escape and the escape route ended up in the same place as the main exit to the fire. So they died, all of them. The five uh, on the wheelhouse jumped off after trying to make an attempt to rescue the others and were saved by a good Samaritan vessel. And afterwards, I will never forget uh, the meeting in the Family Assistance Center of meeting with, you know, uh, 34 families and uh, those of the crew because they are all so devastated after something like that. Um, you know, ranging from everything from anger to just despair. I, I will never forget that. And to this day, I'm, I am in contact with those families. I, I have the greatest regard for what our agency does following such a terrible tragedy. And so, you know, I think about that meeting and think about that every time something happens, that is what keeps me up at night. Not one particular safety issue. It's the families, the friends. And when I say families, I, I'm very inclusive of the definition of family. Whoever considers themselves family members, we are at the NTSB, very inclusive. And so, uh, you know, that's what motivates me. That's why I'm passionate. And uh, um, so, you know, one thing I want to, I do want to talk about is the importance of learning from our past. We have so many retirees right now, both at the NTSB, in industry, in labor, you know, in public safety advocacy that have no idea what a tragedy is like in the moments after, in the weeks after, in the months after. They have no idea what went wrong in the worst cases. We have to talk about those 
to talk about what happened, what went wrong, what went right. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And, and, and discuss how that could prevent something so terrible in the future. I mean, I remember everything, it's South Riding, Virginia, Belling, you know, Bellingham, of course, which created Pipeline Safety Trust, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Marshall, Michigan, San Bruno, East Harlem, Merrimack Valley, which was my first launch at the NTSB, my training launch with the former chair, Robert Sumwalt. But I also want to talk to you about something I always keep in mind. One of the first reports I ever read at the NTSB was one written in 1970. And it taught, it was on valves and it ruptures and uh, leak detection. And um, it talked about a terrible tragedy on May 29th, 1968. A bulldozer uh, was digging uh, an area outside of a church. They said nursery. I assume it was a daycare. We would call it now. Uh, it wasn't at the time of church. And um, struck a one-inch medium pressure pipeline and could not locate. There was a valve. Could not locate the valve. Uh, within moments, the uh, nursery exploded. Nine people died, including seven children. Three others were three other children were seriously injured. And I think about that day, and I, I, I mean, obviously, you know, it's not something I have a personal connection to, but I think about that when I read that report, because the findings and and the the circumstances of that terrible tragedy are just as relevant today as they were then, because we talk about excavation damage all the time. And I think about. Those are still learning lessons for all of us, um, you know, for our new workers. But it's also, um, uh, you know, something that we have to remember. We we can't forget the past, because if we do if we do that, we can't chart a course, a new course for the future. So, uh, but I I do want to highlight it's not just about learning from major tragedies that we investigate because the ones we investigate are generally rare. It's about it, uh, thoroughly, and this is a, a message for the pipeline operators. Uh, I believe you know, that isn't the greatest opportunity for improving safety, just focusing on the majors. I think the most important safety improvement you all could make, and I, I know is shared by uh, several of our investigators, is thoroughly studying the lower consequence incidents the ones that can prevent tragedy down the line. That is something the pipeline operators can do, and we hope you do. And I'm going to throw another one, an, an, and I'm probably over time. I could talk all day if you want me to. Um, I'm going to throw a, a, an, another one at, at you, which is not just learning from past mistakes, from past failures, from lower consequence incidents, not just learning from mishaps, from the rare events, because at the end of most days, Everything went right, right? People clock out, it was a fine day. It is learning from what went right. You have to include that in your pipeline safety management systems and your, your learning is looking at what went right. Because when you look at what went right, you can replicate that. Because if you're only looking at what went wrong, Sometimes you have unintended consequences of then changing what went right. And so cultivating a culture of continuous learning in all operations, all operations, I think is critical. This approach means not just focusing on the absence of safety, but the presence of safety. And I want to repeat that. It's focusing not just on the absence of safety, but focusing on the presence of safety. Because that is what will improve safety. The airline industry has had such a comprehensive safety management system for so many years. It's incredible when I talk to them. I just went to their info share, 1,600 people. It was tremendous, but they didn't just focus on sharing what went wrong. They focused on sharing what went right. And I want to talk about, uh, I want to share a quote from the Flight Safety Foundation, which I would love to connect with the pipeline operators and safety advocates and others, anyone interested. A focus on, and this is the Flight Safety Foundation, a focus on learning from accidents and incidents 
to the exclusion of analyzing all the other cases in which nothing went wrong, representing the vast majority of operate, operations may prevent an organization from discovering critical safety solutions. Once again, a focus on learning from accidents and incidents to the exclusion of analyzing all the other cases in which nothing went wrong, representing the vast majority of operations, may prevent an organization from discovering critical safety solutions. And that's what the industry, the aviation industry, which has a well-formulated safety management system, is now moving into what they're calling safety two. And that's what I just read. And so we, we, I would love to talk about that because it talks about reporting and sharing of good practices, investigations looking at what went well in addition to deficiencies, and the importance of voluntary information sharing. That is important. It is important for industry and, and others to share and be able to share, to learn from each other in a safe setting so that tragedies are prevented. I've seen the success in aviation and it is incredible. There was a day, and I remember very vividly, the Air Florida crash in, in DC. I was, you know, I was young, but I was watching it on TV. My father worked on the Hill, I'll never forget that. And, you know, there was a day where there were hundreds of lives lost in aviation. We are now at, in the last 10 years, seven of those have had no passenger loss of life. So, uh, you know, great success. I want to end um, on a, on a I, I hope, very uplifting note. I am really just honored to know each of you. And please call me Jennifer, not chairman or chairwoman. I'm a friend. I've always been Jennifer. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'm really honored to know each of you. But I want to point out just a couple of, of folks that, and I wanna ask them to come up. I wish I could ask all of you to come up. Um, we don't have much at the NTSB to give out because, well, we have a budget of 129.3. Did I mention we need 145? <laughs> <laughs> but I have some coins. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to bring the, the new board president up, Beth, Beth Wallace. I'd like to bring Bruce up for your incredi incredible, safety leadership, if you, if you don't mind. And I'd like to bring up a group of people who I, I call, will now forever call dear friends, Sean and his team. I'd love to bring up Paige, Rich, Aaron. Where's Dwayne? Are you out there? Uh, you probably have more people and I haven't met them yet. I'm so sorry. Um, who did I forget? Did I forget anybody else? I got Aaron. Oh, John, where's John? Is he over? Where's John? Okay. I mean, I just, you know, I, I do want to say there was a, a, a pipeline release in Edwardsville, Illinois. And I really want to recognize what Marathon Pipeline did and what Sean did. The second that happened, Sean reached out to me. And we had conversations over days. Our, our investigators were really impressed with everything you did on scene. And Aaron, I know you were on scene. I mean, everything you did, it just was top notch. There, I, you know, I, I've met incredible people over the years. I've been honored to meet incredible people across industry, labor, you name it. I just want to say I was really impressed with everything you did. It was a geohazardous, uh, there was a release, of course, but. Um, I, thank you for all you do. And, you know, I do want to recognize Beth, you'll be a great board president. I mean, you've been incredible to work with over the years. You're also a hero and a good friend. And Bruce, none of us wish we were here. We wouldn't have, Pipeline Safety Trust would not have to exist. But out of something so devastating, you brought about change. And I just want to thank you for just knowing you. So I don't have much, but I do have some little coins. Did I mention I need 
And I really look forward to getting to know you as I come back up. If you don't know me, I'm a Starbucks addict. So if I don't get this cup, I'm not actually getting my notes. I'm getting my coffee. Um, uh, no, I really appreciate your time. I'm sure I went over. But as I said, I am very passionate about safety. And I just really, really am honored to work with each and every one of you. And I just invite you to come to the NTSB. When you are in D.C., come see our labs come visit me. Our doors are always open, whether it's me or any of the other board members, we would love to take time to meet with each of you. And thank you all. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. That was amazing. Or Chairwoman Homedy. Um, we're going to move right to the next session because, as Jennifer said, we're running a little long already. Um, so if I can ask the next panel to come up, and we have enough seats. You know, it's a big panel, but everybody can fit up here. Um, I'll just have to tell the people on this side to shut up for the first uh, 20 minutes. And I'm going to see if this clicker thing actually works. Look at that. I don't care. Let's get uh, Sean and Alan at least on the same side. Not that they're not always on the same side, but... What we have here is, this is one of the few sessions we're doing during the conference where we're leaving everybody in the room because we thought it was important for you all to hear about this. One of the Pipeline Safety Trust's um, initiatives and, and priorities over the last, oh, probably ever since San Bruno, but certainly in the last five years, is trying to figure out a better way for the public to engage with the pipeline industry and pipeline regulators. You know, if you look around at even minor things with pipelines, often we don't communicate very well with each other. Um, so we were pushing that for a number of years. Um, we kind of have two panels up here. The first one is going to be me speaking along with Sean that just got the uh, NTSB coin and, uh, and Alan from uh, uh, FIMSA. I have their titles up there. And if you use your fancy QR code on the back of your thing, you can read their bios. I'm not going to do those long introductions because we'd really be long way over time then. Um, but uh, uh, Sean and Alan and I are going to talk a little bit about where this new public engagement standard, which is referred to as RP 1185, isn't that a sexy name, um, came from and why we thought it was important. Uh, and it's really been a work in progress for, like I said, five years. Uh, the reality is, uh, you know, it came from multiple places. We, we talk a lot about the three-legged stool, the industry, government, and public members. And this was done by API, which wasn't our first choice. We thought FIMSA perhaps should take the lead on coming up with a public engagement standard, uh, being kind of the regulator in between the public and the industry. I think in the long run, maybe we think now that uh, doing it through an API standard, because they do standards and public uh, and uh, recommended practices all the time, turned out to be a good thing. It, this came about from a variety of places. You know, I think everybody, the industry, the public, and uh, regulators all recognize that we don't communicate very well. We don't share information very well. We wanted to find a better way to do that. FIMSA gave the Pipeline Safety Trust a grant to kind of investigate that idea, and we held a number of public meetings for a couple of years and came out with some recommendations. Um, and then when FIMSA really couldn't do this because of resource limitations and other reasons, um, API 
volunteered to take it on as part of their accredited standards and run it through them. Um, so that was good. We've been part of a number of API standard efforts and we always have some concerns with that because while they say their standard development is balanced from a public standpoint, we don't see it being very balanced very often. But this effort was really different. There's 24 voting members, eight of them from the industry, eight of them from government, and eight of them from the public. And that we felt very strongly about that. And API and FIMSA supported that idea. And, and that's the way this was developed. Um, you know, and I can't say enough about how important that bounced structure was. I don't know, Alan, Sean, anything you would add? Was that good, bad, indifferent? Critical importance. Oh, no, yeah. Now, Sean, why don't you start? <laughs> I feel like Alan and I are doing a duet here. <laughs> We're sharing the <laughs> microphone. Yeah. So if we start singing. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the process, what, what was really neat about this RP is there wasn't a mandate to go do this, but there was a need. And people from all three legs of the stool, which is just so happens to be the model of this conference is the same three legs of the stool came together to put this together. And I think what's really neat about it is there's a balance there. I, I credit uh, some of the members of the public for ensuring that we do that this way. Simona, I don't know if she's out there, but she was a big champion of that. Others also were saying, hey, we need to have a balance. The other thing that I think was really important was, and I, Chuck Lesniak is, is up here, but you know, we've talked about public engagement for a long time. And it was almost, I'll never forget, um, this was very early in the process. We sat around the table and we had a great half day and we were talking and Chuck all of a sudden stops us and he says, you know, I feel like we are in a time warp. We're talking about this over and over again. When are we gonna stop talking about it and do something about it? And that really propelled us to where we're at today, to having something as a foundation that can carry us forward. So, you know, the, not only the current generation, but the next generation can make it better and quit talking about the same fallacies that we we've failed before at. You know, I've I've enjoyed coming to this conference so often because I get to hear from so many of you. Boy, had we just had a simple discussion, I may not be here today. And I think that's what's important about this 1185 and that process. I think the importance of balance is um, just incredibly uh, necessary for this process. Uh, for many of you that know how we operate, we strive for balance and in getting input from all the stakeholders. So that was so critical for this. We had looked at setting up a, a group, a working group to address public engagement because we had seen issues over the years with um, you know, observations, direct observations, landowner issues, uh, abandoned pipeline issues, you, you name it. Uh, we needed to do better. We need to evolve with the environment around us. So it was very necessary to do something. We recognized our role as the regulator to need to exert leadership in this area. And in looking to stand up a committee, we looked internally and thought, well, you know, that would be ideal. And we've done that before, bringing in different stakeholders. But at the end, the time the environment just wasn't there to set up what was considered um, another group under a, the Federal Advisory Committee Act. And that's where we kind of zeroed in on the uh, ANSI process that uh, API offers through developing a recommended practice that seemed to work and also involve a variety of stakeholders. So we ended up there and it, it's worked out quite well as you'll hopefully hear in the coming uh, as, as all of us talk up here. And one thing that I just want to make clear, you know, API already has a recommended practice on public and public um, awareness that uh, that FIMSA has adopted into the regulations. So companies now are required to do that public awareness. Public awareness tends to be a one way communication. It's what the industry and the regulators and a lot of us think are really important things. You know, call before you dig how to identify if there's a problem, um, you know outreach to local government so they know about pipelines in their area. Um, this is very different. This is two-way communications. Either of you have a thought on the, how this differs from 1162, which is the public awareness, which is a rule at this point. This will just be a recommended practice. Well, the way I like to put it is public awareness is leading the proverbial leading the horse to water and 
and public engagement is getting the horse to drink. It's probably overly simplified. It's much more complex than that. I know, and as we got into the process of, of, of identifying a, a recommended practice, um, there are just so many moving parts. It's a very complex um, system to establish communication and, and true communication and build trust. Just I'll, I'll state the simple. To me, public awareness is a transaction. It's a one way. Engagement is a two way in a discussion. And we have never taken the time to figure out what's that two way look like. Again, how do you make that sustainable? And, and that's what this document's about. It's easy to talk about the one way, but the more important really needle mover for me is the, is the two way. So I want to talk a little bit about where this recommended practice is right now. This is kind of the timeline that started at the beginning of this year. We had been meeting for a, a whole year before this. I think we had 70 some technical group meetings. We were doing it once or twice a month to begin with. We've been doing it a little slower since then. But the recommended practice just was finalized and went out for a vote in public comment yesterday. Um, and there'll be a link at the bottom if anybody wants to read it and comment. We would really like to get your comments back. Um, but we've worked through all of this. It's, it's a done deal now. It's went out for comment in a vote. Uh, I think we'll get a positive vote because we already polled all 25 voting, 24 voting members and everybody's shaking their heads in the right direction. Uh, could change once we see comments, but uh, we'll see. Uh, that will probably, uh, the comment period's open until the end of January. Um, and then we have to address every comment we get. So we hope we don't get 1,500 comments. Uh, we hope we get, you know, a handful of really good ones. But you're welcome to comment. We hope to have it all done and it will be um, finalized and adopted sometime in the spring. You know, I think April is the hopeful date. It might take a little longer than that. Um, and then FIMS always has the ability to make it part of the regulations. And Alan's kind of said that out loud. I don't know if you... Have any comments on that or not? Well, like Carl mentioned, we've already incorporated by reference APRP 1162, which is public awareness. We have the ability as this comes out to also incorporate this by reference. And that will certainly be uh, a topic of discussion. We would have to go through the process of notice and comment, notice a proposed rulemaking to adopt um, a standard, this new standard, but that's kind of the process that happens. And um, you know, our approach right now, we've been engaged in the process and we'll see as far as where the chips fall in the future. I would expect at some point it will be incorporated by reference uh, as, a, as a code requirement. Because um, right now, as you may, may know, as it comes out, as it gets uh, finalized, it would not be a requirement, um, but it's a recommended practice. It's only when it gets put into the code, into part uh, 192 for the gas code or 195 for the liquid code uh, that it would then become a requirement. But that said, we fully expect, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, how do we expect this to be successful? We fully expect that uh, everyone will embrace this standard. It's really a good, good standard. So just to tell you a little bit about what is actually in the standard, we have some core principles. And if you read through these core principles, it looks like something that would come out of a social studies class or something, not out of an API recommended practice. You know, we're talking a lot about openness and transparency and respect and reciprocity and inclusiveness and accessibility and equity. Those are not things you read about much in API standards. And this group really kind of went above and beyond to embrace these things and include that throughout the whole recommended practice. So we hope you'll look at that and see if we've done a good job of it. Any comments on any of those or should we? Uh... The other thing it does, oh, and this one slid off. Well, you, you can see it. Everybody's staring at the floor up here. That's because we have a screen up here. They're not really <laughs> looking at uh, Aaron's shoes. Uh, um, uh, go ahead. I just wanted to add one more thing. Can you go back um, one slide? Really, if you look at these core principles, and you know, I, I like to say that, I mean, if you don't have the, the first two, openness and transparency and respect, really the, the, the rest are very difficult. A lot of times we'll see that maybe one event occurred between say a landowner and an operator that really got the, the ball rolling, got off things off to a bad start and really negatively impacts your ability to work together as you go forward. And that can even happen to us as a regulator as well. Um, 
but those two, you know, having the openness, the transparency and res respect to, um, you know, to, to, to work together. And this is something that we've seen is, has been just greatly in need as we've, as we see all the projects that are constructed, for instance, that there are issues of heavy handedness, uh, you know, maybe the first contact with a landowner might be through a right of way agent. You, you know, maybe there's a different approach to kind of establish this long term relationship that's built more on, you know, two way dialogue. But anyway, and this also it just speaks to a change in culture of how we handle public engagement. Yeah, yeah. I'll just mention Carl. Carl and I did a podcast on public engagement, I don't know, a year or so ago. And uh, one of the things that just kept coming back as as Russell Treat was asking us about the document was it's really these principles are things we learned in kindergarten. It, and, and that's what this is about. It's it's really and then how in putting that on paper. And we literally started with a blank piece of paper. There's there was no book that we follow. There is nothing. So you, what you'll see in this document was really done by that balanced approach, that three legged stool based on these principles. And you can imagine that's why we had 70 meetings. You put people from public interest groups and people from the industry together and talk about try to define what equity or inclusiveness is. And there was a few meetings right there. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, you know, a lot of it relates to environmental justice, which you're going to hear about throughout the conference. And, you know, there's lots of environmental justice issues built into this new recommended practice. Some of the other core things that we did is um, part of this relates to other things like Jennifer just mentioned safety management systems. There's a recommended practice that the industry's really been pushing hard on to implement safety management systems for a number of years now. Um, that's not a, a, a rule or a regulation yet because the industry's really pushed hard and is doing it without it becoming a rule. Um, but a lot, what it says in that safety management system is you need to do public engagement, but it doesn't tell you what public engagement is. It just says you need to do it. So this fills that void of how, telling people what public engagement ought to look like. I um, mean, these are some of the types of language that the industry likes, flexibility and scalability and integration and continuous improvement that really relates to safety management systems and other things. And you were involved very much with safety management system, Sean, comments? You know, I, I, uh, I think, you know, for me, the biggest changer for our industry has been this, you know, safety management system. You know, uh, you talked earlier, Jennifer talked about Bruce's leadership and I, I've so enjoyed getting to know him uh, regarding safety management system and the change he can bring of that. This 1185 is under that same umbrella. So all those terms did come from that same qualitative, not, you know, prescriptive, because there isn't one size that fits all. You know, you've got big operators, small operators, gas, liquids, and we want public engagement doesn't fit, you know, it, it's got to be fit for purpose. And that's the basis of why it was set up under um, 1173 or safety management system, because it, it has been a needle mover. We've got a long ways to go. And I mean, I'm encouraged to get the journey started on public engagement under the same framework. So really the core of the whole RP, there's there's six major elements of it and there's requirements under each of these elements of how you do this. And we're just going to talk really briefly about the six. I think Sean's going to take the first two and I'll clean up. Yeah, we'll, we'll quickly go around these because, because uh, you know, again, it's it's the basis of the document, but it's also meant to be a little bit of almost a, a quick uh, Cliff Notes version. You know, the first one I'll start with is at the top, the commit and align. And that really starts with the operator of at the very top committing to doing public engagement and being committed to that, uh, not to check a box, but to have a relationship. I'm off, often amazed that when something doesn't go right, you know, between the public and an operator, the CEO or the president, as they look back, they kind of say, how did we end up here? Some of it is you got to commit to that we're going to engage and not just do awareness, go beyond that and have real discussions. And just as Jennifer said in her opening that, you know, sometimes it's not, you don't go into it um, hoping you hear what you want to hear. You need to hear what you need to hear. And, and sometimes that'll be in, in disagreement with what you think. And uh, that's, that's that commitment to, to do that. The next is to identify, understand, and confirm the stakeholders. You know, that sounds easy, but I, we've all been in the situation is, oh, I forgot you. And no one feels worse than the person that got forgot. And our goal is right up front, 
let's identify those and make sure we've been comprehensive. Because again, that one person that you forget may be the game changer that defines between success, what went right, what went wrong. And I, I think that's uh, really important in, in how to do that in a formal way. Yeah, and the, the next one is plan and prepare, because once you identify stakeholders, and if you have a pipeline that's running 2,000 miles, you're going to have a lot of stakeholders identified. Um, and in understanding them is even more difficult. You know, what are their interests? Why do they care about pipelines? Then you need to plan how you're going to implement that stuff. The fourth one is share information. You know, stakeholders can plug into this whenever they want. If you get a bee in your bonnet about a pipeline, you might contact a company. Uh, so the companies need to be ready for that and, and ready to share information, but they also need to start the conversations often. So share information also is how pipeline companies, when they're, whether it's a new pipeline or they're going to do a dig on a pipeline, are going to get information out to all those stakeholders that are identified to start the conversations and the engagement. And then finally, the, maybe the most important one is how are you going to you know, listen to what you get back. Because we've all <laughs> been through workshops that seem like they're just hoop jumps. You know, okay, this had a workshop, we came in and we testified for two hours and then they did what they wanted anyway. Well, that's what we're trying to avoid. We really want people to listen to what's going on and then change the way they do based on what they what they hear. And the final one, which is completes the loop, is this, con this continuous improvement. And Yeah, I, I personally believe this is the most important step um, this is about being a, a learning system. Uh, sometimes it's easy to run past that and just start over again. But if you really want to make a change, you better do the monetary evaluate and adjust well. And we all know, and as we talk with in human relationships, we all can, boy, I wish I wouldn't have said it that way. I wish I would have done something. I wish I would have approached them earlier. Which it would, there's, there's things all of us on all three legs of the stool to, to improve upon. And it, to me, it's the most important step, but it's also the hardest. And we have lots of fancy charts like this. Oh boy, decision trees. Um, you don't know how much time we spent coming up with how do you share information? And this is a decision tree where, you know, oftentimes the public feels like what the industry is looking for is a way to say, no, I want some information and no, you're not going to get that. It's, it's security sensitive or it's proprietary or something. We really worked through a decision tree trying to get people to how do you get to say yes? How do you give people information they want? We're flipping it around. And uh, I think, you know, everybody embraced this in the end. We had a number of discussions that took a while on this. Um, yeah, I'll just, hey, Carl, I'll just comment on that. Um, we were, as a, as a group, we were somewhat at a stalemate how to do this. And there was all kinds of different opinions. And I credit Carl for coming up with this decision tree because it, it probably documented what we all meant, but we couldn't either remember what each other was saying or understand our intent. And everyone could get behind it. And to me, one of the neat things about this team is we had to engage and actually do engagement to get to where we're at today. And we, we listened and learned. And again, we, we didn't start off with doing a decision tree. We were at a stalemate. And, and Carl said, let me try to put something on paper. And this is what we came up with. So blame him. They changed some of my arrows around as we talked about it, though. <laughs> I, I can add, yeah, this went through several iterations, as you can imagine. It was probably one of the toughest areas we dealt with. We, we had lists of examples of things you might share. And, you know, as a regulator, my view of a list is they're great. They're, they can be comprehensive, but you always miss something. So really, we needed to develop a, uh, a process. It looks daunting, but it really, it, it works. And um, one thing I always tell people, if you, if you lead off with, no, you can't have that, you know, that's, that's the worst. You've, you've got to find a way to work with people. This uh, flow chart here will uh, provide that mechanism to work and, and find a way to share information. I've already talked a little bit about what's next. Like I said, it's out for public comment right now as of yesterday until the end of January. Um, and then we have to reconcile the comments we get and then it will get published and implementation will start. Um, the person, you want to talk a little bit about how the industry implements recommended practices and, and pick on somebody out in the crowd that might have something to do with that? Yeah, I, I want to ask Andrea Grover just to stand up real briefly. Uh, Andrea is from Enbridge. 
Um, she's going to be leading the industry implementation team. And uh, that sounds, um, okay, that's kind of simple. It's probably going to be the toughest job, even what we had just gone through to get where we're at today. It's a multi-year journey. Uh, to me, it's the X factor of how well the effectiveness of this document ends up being, how well we do implementation. And sometimes they think, well, we'll just, you just got to read it and go do it. It's, it's not like that. What's that look like for the flexible, scalable, the small operator, the big operator? And, and Andrea has got a cross-functional team, including Carl and Chuck are going to be advisor to, on it to help give insight of what are we missing. And, and I look forward to their progress. And again, I think as we all see, you know, over the next few years, it's a journey, just like I, I said many times on SMS, not a destination. We just need to keep ensuring we, we check and adjust, keep learning and growing, and we will move the needle. And Andrea is going to help us uh, lead that effort. So, and, yep. and I, I'm sorry, Carl, it is already underway. One of the things that the team did, and we learned this from SMS, the earlier you kind of start engaging the implementation team, the better. And so we started them a, f a few months ago. Uh, even before we went to ballot, we knew where we were going to be, but we wanted to start. So they've already hit the ground running. So it's not like, well, we'll wait to the ballot, then we'll go implement. It's already started. So there's been a nice overlap. So the implementation team has seen the intent of the people up on the 1185. What was our intent? Now, you know, we're not smart enough to say what's that look like out in reality. They can help us um, uh, put that together. And I've already switched the slide, and this is how, if you want to comment, this tells you how to do that. It's, 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 you go to the API website, and you can download the uh, RP, and you make comments. Their system is not particularly user-friendly. They have an Excel spreadsheet, and you have to comment in this spreadsheet and send it in in certain ways, but it's not all that complicated. So, uh, um, And if you need help, let us know. We're glad to help you do that. Um, now, the rest of these people who sit quietly, which I'm just amazed at, actually, <laughs> um, are some of the public members that took part in the RP. And we thought it would be interesting to put those up. I'm just going to introduce them real quickly. Uh, Jessica is the executive director of TREAD from Texas. TREAD is like, don't tread on me, property rights type stuff. Um, uh, Kirk Yelbert from, is a professor at Arizona State University. Chuck Lesniak's been at this for a long time. He used to be with the city of Austin, Texas, and now he's a consultant. Um, Gerard, the Honorable Mayor Gerard Neugebauer from Green, Ohio. Uh, who did I miss? Greg Perry, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau. And he has other hats he wears too. And David Kane runs Wind Horse Strategies Initiative, Boulder, Colorado, which works mainly with indigenous groups around the country. So. Folks, before I even jump in on questions for you, you just listen to the three of us try to explain what this has been for the last two or three years. Anybody hear anything they want to talk about? Question? Um, you know, one of the things that is important to me about this is that the industry understands and the people that look at this understand and as you think about it, as, as you comment, is that in my mind, this is intended to be a paradigm shift. I'm sure all of you, industry, public government, have all dealt with situations in new pipelines, post incidents, that sort of thing, where the where the discussions, the conversations just didn't go well. And that uh, I came from government where the public owned our information. We shared everything, unless there was some really, really good reason why we couldn't share it. And when somebody asked us for information, we didn't get to make a judgment call. We weren't allowed to make a judgment call about whether or not the requester should have that information or could understand that information. That wasn't our job. And we weren't allowed to do that. To some extent, that's what this is intended to do is, is just try to get the industry to share information and be transparent without making a judgment about whether or not the requester is qualified to understand that information whether they should have that information, but to just give it to them and help them understand it and, and have a dialogue that is truly based on a shared set of facts. That's a great segue. And I, you know, I, I'd like to put Jessica on the spot because Jessica's worked a lot with new pipelines in Texas going into place. And I was wondering when you, you've worked on this recommended practice 
you know, part of it is we're hoping it helps build trust and transparency between landowners and operators. Do you think this can improve, you know, the way pipeline routing process for landowners works and deal with some of those tensions we always see? Yes, I would agree. Can everyone hear me? Um, I would agree with that. You know, Texas is a unique environment because um, 95 percent of the land in Texas is privately owned and about 84 percent of that is rural. Um, so the landowner is really a key stakeholder in all of these discussions and projects um, specific to Texas. And so having these types of standards is really um, helpful for transparency and communication, but also where we see it is helping streamline the process for construction of a pipeline. Um, one of the things that we have experienced is that, you know, not all operators are created equal, which is why we want these kinds of standards to create best practices. Um, in Texas, there's little or no regulation and permitting that is required for a pipeline. And so this kind of allows for the good operators to show up, work with landowners and other key stakeholders in order to you know, execute the project, but also kind of shines a light on uh, the operators who aren't as, you know, up and up on things. Um, and what we've seen, the success of not only the construction and, you know, getting um, the product online a lot faster is when a landowner has a seat at the table. There are public hearings, there's comment, um, all of the routes are evaluated. You know, something that TRED has been advocating for is a full-blown routing process that would go through the Public Utility Commission in Texas, but also work with the Railroad Commission. We're an interesting dynamic with agencies in our state. Um, and really, it's just a matter of helping industry get their job done, but also making sure that all the key stakeholders are aware of what's going on. And really, the best stewards are the ones who own the land, which is the landowner. So this, in my opinion, has been a great start. It's been a wonderful education for me and my membership. Um, and so we're hoping to take some of the, the things that we've learned in the application of these standards to apply um, what we can do personally in our state to help streamline this process and keep this relationship going. Thanks, Jessica. And we are going to give all of you a chance to ask us questions. But um, some of you may know that I spent 12 years as an elected county commissioner. I'm still recovering from that adventure. Um, but it, it really made me, um, I, I got a call out of the blue from Green, Ohio. I can't remember how many years ago that was now. And that's where I met Mayor Nugabauer. Um, you know, and as an elected mayor, you seem to at that time have been caught between the people you were elected to represent in a huge gas transmission pipeline that was proposed right through your community. Um, so you were in the crossfire. Um, no matter what you did, people were mad at you. Um, through this RP, you know, um, your, your powers were extremely uh, to interfere to influence that interstate pipeline were really small. I mean, you tried, but your, your power was pretty small. Do you think this RP can change the dynamic that you were caught in the crossfire of? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, getting caught in a crossfire, uh, maybe, maybe not the best um, way to describe it. Uh, as a local elected official, I was clearly on the side of the public landowners. Um, and even on the three-legged stool, we've had this discussion many times. Uh, that I'm included in government, uh, but there's a big difference between um, regulatory agencies, the federal and state level, and a local official who is representing the people. So I, I was clearly on the side of the residents, and we were trying to help the residents uh, through this process, and it was it was very difficult and very frustrating. Um, so I'm I'm probably least qualified in this room to talk about um, this issue because I was, I was just like a member of the public. I was dragged in because a pipeline was coming through our city. Another unique factor is that, you know, many times these are cited through rural areas. And in this case, it was decided to come through a, a suburban city, uh, with, with a lot of impact of landowners. And so it was a very unique situation. I think that, um, by, by starting this process, and I think the industry bears a lot of uh, weight in, in making this happen. It sets the stage, I think, for a, a much better process of engaging the residents and, and making somebody in my position, our job, a lot easier. Um, it, it doesn't help the cause. It doesn't help. You can't help your residents if, if you can't get the information that they can't get. Um, I had no more access to that than 
than, than the public did. And so this process of, of feeling like you can include uh, the public in, in the process, give them the information that they may need. Yeah, um, sometimes it may seem contrary to the goal of the industry uh, to do this. And, and I think that ultimately this is going to improve um, the success of the industry. It may, it may cost less money uh, in the long run to do the, the things up front uh, that, that set the equation right for the public. And, and I hope that the industry can see this and, and really feel this. And I know Sean Lyons, I've worked with him for the last five years, and, and you can see the passion he has um, to, to do the things that are necessary. And, and I think the industry can take note of how, how that approach really, really is, is a model of success and ultimately uh, will be cost effective uh, in, in your job. So I, I appreciate being involved in this um, and uh, it's been very rewarding. Uh, but something I never expected to be involved as a local official. Me neither. Um, Greg Perry is a farmer from Pennsylvania, but he wears different hats because he also has expertise. He is a consultant on corrosion and pipeline integrity. So uh, joining the public caucus of this thing, he brought lots of expertise to it. One of the issues that Greg really pushed us on was information sharing because he's seen how difficult it is for particularly the farm community to get their hands on information, especially technical information. You know, if a farmer asks a pipeline company for, I want to see your integrity management plan, they don't, usually don't get very far. Want to talk about that a little, Greg, and how this might change that? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I think uh, um, uh, the implementation will tell uh, in the long run how this is going to work. Uh, but I, I'm tentatively hopeful. Um, yeah, as, uh, as Carl said, I, it came as a bit of a surprise to me that I became a farmer because I married a farmer. Um, and one of the things that really astonished me uh, when I got more involved in farming uh, and, and more involved in the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau uh, is the level of tech, technical acumen that is basically required of, of modern farmers in order to become successful. Um, I, it really was quite impressive. Um, but yes, I did become involved in the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and through them part of their policy development process, which is uh, like all state farm bureaus and, and the National Farm Bureau, uh, quite uh, an involved and well-refined process. And um, American farm, uh, the American Farm Bureau has um, a good bit of policy already on pipelines. Um, they're generally in favor of the fuels that they provide. They, they need a lot of fuel. Um, there are some issues with eminent domain, uh, but one of the things that they, they have specifically uh, on the books is that they're interested in condition reports. And by that, I mean, um, evaluations of the conditions of the pipelines. Um, you know, how RP uh, 1185, I think, might affect uh, this relationship. Um, well, farmers and, and farming communities can sometimes be pretty reluctant to new things and to new people coming into their community. Uh, and it, it can be, they can be a little standoffish about getting involved. Uh, I think it's really important uh, when a new pipeline is coming through, and in some cases where a pipeline that's been there for quite a while uh, that nobody knows about, um, with the engagement process, uh, it's really important to reach out to farmers, uh, to let them know the importance of getting involved in early on, um, because some of them can be quite fatalistic about aspects of pipeline safety. They, and they tend to see that all going to the, the attention of the city people that make a lot of noise about what they care about. Um, so that they do need a bit of reach out and encouragement. Uh, but one, when you do get involved with them, they've got very specific concerns. They care a lot about uh, things like uh, um, uh, slope, uh, drainage. Uh, they have a lot of underground drain tile. Um, and, and of course, they have the surface operations that they're very interested uh, in, in being able to do. Oftentimes, they have very limited windows to, to do the farming things that they need to do. Um, but
But I th also, I think you can find that farmers care very deeply about issues like sustainability um, and uh, conservation. So, uh, you know, they, they do have an interest in the pipeline that is going through. Um, I think once they are engaged with, they could be welcoming. They would like to see pipelines become part of their communities. Uh, and, and of course, the, the personnel involved with pipelines. Uh, and, and they want they want information. They want to know about the safety uh, and what's being done to help them. Great. Thanks, Greg. One of the things we really struggled with was the RP. Uh, like I mentioned, we spent a lot of time dealing with environmental justice. And one aspect of that was indigenous rights. Um, you, you know, we have lots of... You know, you haven't had to pay much attention to the news to know that sometimes pipeline issues go wrong when you start dealing with uh, tribal communities. Um, we had uh, one of the 24 voting members who was from a tribe, Travis. Did, has Travis showed up yet? There he is right there. Travis was part of the RP as, as part of that. And David Kane, who has a consultancy out of Colorado, works mainly with indigenous groups. Uh, how do you see this RP perhaps helping with some of those relations. Yeah, I could talk about this for a whole day. Uh, two I'll, minutes. I'll, yeah, two <laughs> minutes. I just first want to acknowledge that um, for all of you here, most of you are probably landowners in some form or another, own a home on some land. And I want to acknowledge that there are over 20 tribes that, in this area of New Orleans who occupied this land traditionally and historically. So I want to acknowledge that. I won't list all of them, but there are at least 20 tribes, probably more bands that I know of. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, as far as it, I'm really, I was really happy to participate in the RP and what the long way and the progress that we made. I do want to make a couple comments about um, the use of the term public and stakeholders, which is a term we fought over <laughs> uh, pretty intensely in our, in our, as we went through the RP. Uh, I just want to recognize too, and I, I think it's important for industry and regulators to, to acknowledge that tribes are not the public. They have guaranteed rights in the U.S. Constitution and um, special, special rights also in the 14th Amendment. So we have to recognize that when we're engaging tribes. We hear these terms consultation, government, government consultation all the time. And this RP makes uh, a, you know, a pretty big step in terms of doing that. Having said that, uh, I'm a white guy. I work with tribes. Uh, I have a lot of contacts with people who are indigenous attorneys, um, various people in indigenous governments. Many of these people don't trust this RP, that it's going to make any difference for them. I'll just say that flat out. I've polled over 40 people that I've talked to, and, and they'll probably make some public comments, but they don't particularly aren't. So it's going to really fall on government and industry to prove that they are true to this. And having said, to, said that, recognizing uh, the United Nations, United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This is something that's very important to, to um, Indigenous people across the country, across the globe. Um, if you followed COP27, there were a lot of um, discussions with Indigenous groups about how they fit in, um, in the decision-making process and how they haven't They've been excluded from that in a lot of ways. Um, and people also hear a lot about these land back issues. Rest assured, indigenous people are not, they are asking for some of their lands back, their traditional homelands and their traditional practices. So, but I think the RP makes a real, you know, makes an effort towards doing that. So I'm, my hope is during the implementation that a lot of, um, a lot better engagement happens. Um, I think there's still a long way to go in recognizing um, indigenous people and how they view the world. That includes their knowledge, which existed for 4,000 years. Uh, that's something to recognize. Science alone is not, they, they have scientific knowledge about things on the, in the world that science hasn't yet touched. Um, you can only look to the Amazon forest and the things they're still discovering in the Amazon, what indigenous people know. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the only other thing is the transparency piece. Uh, I'll just I'll just call it out. Uh, industry has tried to undermine indigenous people in a lot of ways, spying on them. This happened at Dakota Access. This happened at another other pipelines, and I want to recognize that. This is why indigenous people don't trust a lot of what goes on with industry and government. 
So I just want to recognize that, that we're at a critical time in our country, and I'll only speak about the United States, but I work globally also, where uh, transparency is hugely important and authenticity and engagement is important because indigenous people feel very empowered and will continue to rise up. Uh, you hear about these things. These are not just things that this is in their culture, this is in their blood. And I want to really encourage people to recognize that, that they will, they don't feel disempowered. They feel like they have power. So I just want to recognize that. And I'm looking forward to, you know, seeing this implemented and doing everything I, I can in, in a, on a day-to-day -day basis to do that. So. Great. And I just want to do a plug for another session this afternoon, because coming through this whole public engagement, you know, looking at how indigenous communities in the U.S. are really sovereign nations and their rights are guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution. So if you're one of those people that likes to wave around the U.S. Constitution, you're supporting, you know, indigenous rights. Uh, we were surprised that in Canada, they've the engagement with indigenous communities has been done a little differently. So there's a session this afternoon. If you're interested in that, I encourage you to come hear that because the Canadian federal regulator um, ha has is out in front on some of these issues. And we're going to hear from some of the indigenous folks and some of those regulators this afternoon about how well that's been worked. Finally, let me get to Greg and then or get to Kirk, and then we'll uh, open it up for comments from you. Kirk brought a very you know interesting perspective to this because he's now a a professor at Arizona State University, but before that, you know, he's worked for advocacy groups and he's identified, I don't, I think it was several hundred, you know, smaller groups working on pipeline issues around the country um, and, and how they go about that and how they tr try to deal with pipeline issues. So I was wondering, Kirk, if you could just talk briefly about you know, how this RP might change the way those small groups work and also about just with your academic hat on, you know, what kind of assessment do we need of whether this is going to be successful or not? Yeah, thanks for that, Carl. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there's a, a few really good points that you made. First of all, in the research that I've been doing over the last few years, uh, and you'll see that this um, touches on a few of the topics we've already mentioned, that a lot of organizations that emerge in response to pipelines begin uh, as single issue uh, individual landowners um, whose concerns don't get heard or addressed. And then that results in landowners feeling disenfranchised. And then that results in landowners organizing and choosing that their only option is to stop a project, right? And that's not indicative of all organizations. Others come from different places in which they may not want a project from the beginning. But I think that it's, um, uh, I think it's in our um, best interest to realize that there's a diversity of needs that exist out in the public in terms of what they need or want from an engagement strategy. And, um, and I think that this RP starts to open that up uh, and create a space of dialogue. Um, also in doing research on the many different advocacy organizations, and like you said, you know, something like 700 organizations in this country working on various, you know, pipeline related projects from an advocacy perspective, they really um, rely quite a lot on information from agencies and what small amount they can get from operators to be able to make sense of projects. And in my opinion, a better informed public is one that is able to negotiate their needs and be able to be in more educated dialogue with operators and industry when it comes time to figure out how to address those needs. And so by creating information blocks, we actually also do a disservice to what we all feel as though we need to be whole in this process, right? And the other thing I just wanna say is, and this gets to what David was uh, talking about, it's also at our disadvantage to monolithic definitions of public, right? The public is not one thing, it's many publics. And you know, through the course of defining what we mean by the public and saying, well, there's landowners, but there's also neighboring communities and there's also local township officials and there's, they all have different needs, right? And they all have different demands and they all have different concerns and, and identifying those um, like really in very detailed form was one of our tasks in this process. And what that does is that I think it sets an agenda for when operators do get approached for information or when they do need to go out into a community, they can anticipate what kinds of conversations they need to be prepared for and how they need to be training 
you know, the individuals in the organizations who are going to be doing this work to be informed about what kinds of questions they need to field and what kinds of information they have to have with them in order to field those conversations, right? Um, and in particular, you know, one of the, the aspects of this that I was, um, you know, asked to really do a heavy lift on was the environmental justice component and defining what that is and what that means. Um, and I think that fundamentally um, the indigenous rights component of, is part of it, but we also need to recognize that even when the communities that we may not think of as environmental justice communities, there are marginalized populations that come from different starting points and have different needs. And um, ignoring that that is the case is also to our disadvantage because uh, communities have, we should be thinking about this from a holistic perspective, right? And we want to make sure that we actually identify and reach out to and do that proactively um, and not, you know, assume that if we just sort of, you know, block our ears and our eyes, then those individuals will not be a problem for us, right? And and I say this because we need to be really effectively addressing historically marginalized and, and disproportionately burdened communities from a, a range of perspectives. And this industry is implicated in that in many ways. Now, something that I'm starting to get roped into quite a lot in the last year has been um, just this massive preparation for build out of all different kinds of infrastructure as a result of all the money that's going to be coming through the Department of Energy through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act and, you know, tens of billions of dollars to build out things like carbon infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure, electrical infrastructure, right? And 10% of the review requirement on these uh, proposals has to, you have to, as part of putting in proposals, develop a uh, Justice 40, which is 40% uh, of the benefits of these projects need to go to historically disadvantaged communities in which the projects are going to be built. And they have to have robust community engagement protocols. One of the things that I'm discovering as I'm talking to people and as people are approaching me to be, you know, consultants or parts of these projects is that they have no idea how to do community engagement. And we're talking about tens of billions of dollars that are going to projects going to be built in the next day in which they do not know how to do community engagement. And as I've been reflecting on this, I've been looking at RP1185 and saying, what a wonderful model for community engagement. And maybe this is something that we should be thinking about propagating into the portfolios of people who are trying to you know, establish how to do this in other places as well. And so, I mean, it, it, I, I just wanna say that I think it actually is a very proactive and, and a very meaningful document. And, and I really uh, hope that the implementation, implementation team is able to be successful in helping the operators really see that and, and really take this to heart because I think it really is a sea change and a paradigm shift. And, and uh, but, you know, proof is always in the pudding, what we choose to do with it, right? Thank you. Great. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. We'd love to hear, have questions from people. We've got a couple of people with microphones, at least one I see. Me first. Who gave her the microphone? I don't know. <laughs> so Linda Darty with FEMSA. So first, uh, a comment and then a question. The comment is, I'm actually heartened to hear that this was a difficult process for you all. Because that means if you do something and it's too easy, you probably didn't do it right. So the fact that you struggled through it, it really put some thought and interest. That's good. That was my comment. The question I have is oftentimes when a standard is built, it's created, a lot of effort goes into it, it's tossed over to the fence, and then it's like, yeah, y'all just go do it. And I understand there's someone that's working on an implementation team. My question is, who's the hall monitor to check on actual implementation? How well is it effectively being done? You know, who's going to come back in and check and say, yeah, that was successful or, whoa, we missed the target. I see my boss up here laughing, so I must have said something I shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, I think he hit a bunch of nerves because I'm just itching to answer that one. And so, so I've got the microphone, but I, I won't take it for long. And first, your point about, you know, that we struggled with it was good. You know, there was the three legs of the stool and you're seeing a lot of the public caucus is what we called it here. And we had lots of meetings beyond those 71 meetings. And we found out that the eight of us don't even agree on a whole lot of stuff. Uh, so we had to struggle within our own caucus. Beth was one of those, and she's nodding her head over here. Um, as far as, you know, evaluation, Kirk kind of has put together an idea for how we can move forward and evaluate whether this is working or not, you know. And so we're, we're looking for funding to help with that. And Kirk, you can talk about that al uh, along with, and I'd love to hear from maybe Andrea or uh, uh, Greg about how API actually evaluates things, too. 
Yeah, I, you, that question is critical, and it's exactly what I'm pivoting to right now because, like I said, the proof is in the pudding, right? And uh, so I'm trying to ramp up a, a multi-year study because I feel like these few years in which 1195 hits the ground are probably the most critical, certainly from a regulatory perspective. If you're examining this as something that could get adopted as code down the road, wouldn't it be nice to know how it, it's actually landing, right? And and I think that this has to be done in partnership with the ways in which the API implementation team is doing its own evaluation and monitoring. But I come and my team comes with a different set of skills and abilities um, that can reach different audiences. And I think that fundamentally, when one is evaluating whether or not 1185 is working or not, you actually need to talk to the stakeholders and ask them and have it be a participatory evaluation process and say, what does success look like to you? And have we met success, right? And uh, and and then finding a way in which that that process of evaluation doesn't just become uh, you know a thumbs up or a thumbs down on a process, but something in which, as we heard previously from NTSB, we identify what is working, identify what needs you know additional work to be able to work appropriately, identify unintended consequences that we didn't think about at all when we were developing the RP, and then bundle that all together and figure out what we can do with that information to actually make it so that it can be stronger in a 2.0 version or an adopted version or wherever it might be. Yeah. Right. You know, now's the perfect time to get some baseline studies going so we know where public engagement is at at this point. If you ask each of us how well public engagement is doing, you're going to hear something different based on what we heard. But there's not a uh, overall strategy out there getting baseline information. So three years from now, we can see whether we've improved or not. Sean, anything to add to how you guys do it? I'll just I'll mention about five, six years ago, we, we um, put in a new pipeline. It was about, I don't know, 50 miles. Uh, and uh, so we, we took our things that we, we viewed as engagement at the time and tried to apply that. But then after the project was completely over, a year after, not right after, a year after, we went uh, door to door and asked each landowner, how did we do? And it was very, very enlightening. And some things I think we did well, some things we need to do better. And it was really those, those discussions, that's the check and adjust that we need to have. And it does, in some ways, it doesn't need to be much more complex than that. You know, how well did we do some of those things? And, but it just, uh, and, and again, the landowners were very honest. I, I will say we, we did that through a third party facilitator that we weren't even in the room because we, we didn't want to hear what they might say. And, and so we, now they knew we were going to, you know, hear it or watch it. And it was, it was very helpful. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I was uh, excited about um, the honorable Jennifer's comment about learning and uh, from, I think the opportunity for learning comes from sharing the data and sharing the results. I saw that information sharing was one of the pieces of the pie. But I wonder if there is a, you know, a possible addition to the model that would include sharing the results afterwards or sharing the findings or sharing the position. So what if each of the legs of the stakeholders, what if each of the stakeholders wrote like a paragraph summarizing their take on it? What if the year afterwards there was a, you know, a summary and some sharing publicly of the documents and the findings? Um, how could that help? so that the findings weren't isolated to this, but became more broadly part of it and shared on the EPA website or something. That's, that's a great comment. And, and when you get a chance to actually read the document, you can see that some of that is built in there about how the industry does describe what they're doing and how they're doing and even involving the public in some of those ongoing discussions. And like was mentioned, Chuck and I have been put on the implementation team to help bounce that out a little bit and to keep track of some of those things too. Anybody else have comments on that sharing? I'll just mention, we learned this on the safety management system implementation. You need to have that, um, what have you done and what have you learned in it? And we actually did an annual report every year and we still do it on safety management system. I don't wanna put things or put more to do on Andrea's list, but I could see something like that in public engagement. What's that annual report? How far have we gone? Where do we need to go? And what's some of our learnings? Uh, again, that was, and, it, and we then we would share that annual report with all the stakeholders, the three legacy. Do you agree with it? Hey, are we missing? I remember we would meet with NTSB. We would meet with FEMSA on SMS uh, and go through that annual report. And they might say, you guys are missing this, or have you thought about this? So I could see that model being applicable here, but it's a good comment. I, I, I can add, <clears throat> um, 
I'm certainly uh, I'm going to be going back to um, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and probably American Farm Bureau and let them know we were involved, we were asked to be involved in this and this is the new process. So I would invite everybody to to take a look at their local pipelines and and say yeah they've got a new engagement thing. So just go ahead and call your local pipeline companies and let them know how well they're doing. <laughs> One of the things that we didn't mention is what's the, the scope of this RP. There's over 3 million miles of pipelines in this country, and most of those pipelines are not included in this, this new recommended practice because we left out distribution pipelines, which makes up the vast majority. Um, so this is transmission pipelines, gathering pipelines, not the distribution systems. And we did that because distribution is really a different beast than transmission. And... Uh, and other political considerations. I, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, um, now, AGA and the distribution people certainly have, were, were part of this and will be looking at this and probably implementing it. Um, and Alan, certainly, if he decides to put it into uh, the regulations, can rope in whoever he wants. Carl, it may be also worth mentioning the difference in life cycles between the fact that 1185 covers the life cycle of a project as opposed to just in the ground, because I think that's really significant. Go for it. Yeah. So um, with 1162, which is the public awareness RP that's now uh, code, uh, you know, outreach, uh, landowner education, you know, mostly you know, around hazards and, and, you know, location information is about projects that are only in the ground. And I think that's something that's really unique about 1185 is that it's meant to cover full life cycle from you know, the point of planning a project all the way to decommissioning a project, a pipeline, um, and having engagement strategies throughout that entire process, and also identifying how needs and concerns of the various publics that I talked about may change over the course of the life cycle of a pipeline project. Uh, and I think that that's really novel in, in that, you know, I think, for instance, when I look at the you know, the FERC, you know, certificate process for being able to, um, you know, uh, get approval for a natural gas pipeline. And you see, you know, if you've ever looked at the flow charts, they say, oh, here's where the public engagement components are, right? And you look at how much happens in the course of a pipeline planning that before you even get to that first opportunity for public engagement, right? And so I see this as an opportunity for upstreaming that, for upstreaming engagement to the point where we can actually start getting dialogue before we start digging, before we start approving permits, right? And also getting to the point where we have a lot of aging infrastructure that's going to need to be replaced or, or just dug up and turned off. And you know, what does that look like too? And how do we start planning for that sort of post-pipeline future in those communities and what do they want done, right? We have to have that conversation too. Carl, if I can add to that, you know, sure. we, we talked about siting and the question was asked of me, but really what I had to flip in my mind as a local official was from the siting process to the operations process, from being adversarial with a pipeline now to being a partner uh, with, with that, their operations. And, and it struck me earlier as Jennifer was speaking about safety and the airline, the commercial air, airline industry, their safety level is, is almost unimaginable you know, to, to put 250 people in an airplane full of fuel and fly them, you know, two, three hours, five hours, 12 hours, and, and the safety level that they've achieved. So the process of operating these pipelines and the, and the, and the engagement you have with us as local officials, how important that is. And just imagine if you could do what the airline industry did was to, to have zero accidents to have zero fatalities and how much easier a job will be when you can achieve something like that it's what we're trying to do with surface transportation the airline industry is this incredible model of doing something very dangerous and making it almost perfection of safety it's incredible so that should be on from my level it's the operation side now that's, that's super critical because my job now is to protect the residents who have a pipeline nearby and, and keep them safe and, and peace of mind, right? Not only are they safe, but they know they're safe, right? And, that, and that's critical. And that's something that we can all be part of. They're waving the five minute flag at me down here, but that means we have a couple more questions. And I was just gonna say, if somebody asks a question, if you could introduce yourself and say where you're from, that would help the people on the webcast. Hi, my name is Lisa Sorg and I'm an environmental investigative reporter with NC Policy Watch, a nonprofit newsroom in North Carolina. And I have a question about the um, a situation in North Carolina right now where um, Smithfield Foods and Dominion Energy are planning a network of biogas gathering lines. And they have for 
upwards of about two years, refused to disclose to the state or to the public the proposed route of those gathering lines. Um, they've not really justified their refusal. Sometimes they say national security. But I would be interested to know if any of you have encountered this with biogas and if the RP is going to uh, address biogas at all. Want to try to try to take that jurisdictional one, Alan? Well, biogas is certainly an issue we're dealing with these days. As far as the siting questions related to that, perhaps it's a local siting issue. I mean, from time to time, we get questions about that, but I would funnel those to the local authorities there who are likely involved in that. I'd be glad to talk with you or or get someone who can talk with you to you know further you know get some answers for you. Chuck, uh, oh, you, by the way, excuse me. The uh, as far as the RP coverage for that, if it's um, if if it is um, covered by our regulations, by our, our oversight uh, program, it would be covered by the RP. That's kind of the line we we took, with the exception of distribution pipelines, the predominant piece. Hope that helps. Yes, yeah, so it would kind of depend on the size and the pressure of the pipelines, what yeah. they're operating at. Right. But it sounds like they could be included. Uh, you know, I I want to speak to the siting process. Um, generally, and it, I think it applies to that situation as well, is, you know, historically with most new pipelines, the operator does their work, their planning work in a black box. And shortly, not too long before they're ready to go, go to construction, they start trying to acquire, acquire properties. For most of the public, including local governments, that's the first time they know about the pipeline. They don't have any information about it. What this does, and this has been to me, the big success of this RP is getting sighting into it because that has been a no-go zone for the industry in these kind of discussions for as long as I've been involved, like 20 years. <clears throat> and this, so this is new and really, really big. And I think that ultimately my hope is and belief is that the industry will find this to be a good thing to bring the public in, to bring local government in much earlier in the process. We'll get pipelines that um, are in better locations, are safer to operate, um, and are safer for the public. And at first, I think this is going to be one of the big challenges for the industry is to share that information early and to partner with landowners and public officials early. Um, and But I think ultimately this will benefit everybody in the industry will find that this is a good thing. And I, and I want to add is that Hopefully this RP will uh, have the industry sharing a lot of information. It's not intended to make everybody agree. That's not the intent. It's, as I said before, to, everybody, to have everybody having a discussion on a shared set of facts, on a common set of facts and information. And ultimately, hopefully that will reduce the level of disagreement. Um, and but also make it so maybe at the end of the day, you still disagree, but you can disagree without di being as disagreeable. We're out of time. I'm sorry. Oh, can um, we? Have, can we have, I saw oh, Travis had his hand up and I want oh, Tra I'd like to hear from Travis. Yeah, go ahead, Travis. There's a number of people. Maybe before you speak, Travis, anybody that was involved with this RP, if they can raise their hand or stand up, because there's other people in the room from the industry and from government that were part of this, too. Um, so. Feel free to track any of these people down and uh, and ask them more if you're interested. Go ahead, Travis. <laughs> Where's the mic? <laughs> yeah, but they can't on the webcast. <laughs> So first off, when industry reaches out to me beforehand, and a couple pipelines have done that, no pipelines in North Dakota have gone through Lakes Kakawea since I became involved without my uh, concurrence. And so when they reach out to me, we go over designs, what we want. One of the biggest saviors for us has been HDD boring. So we no longer allow trenching into the lake. We demand that it be bored. And so by getting my dialogue, they're getting my support, and if they don't have that dialogue, then they're getting my opposition and it hasn't you know, fared well for them. And that's kind of the point of this is just to have the dialogue. Second, when we establish our pipeline guidelines on our reservation, 
We had over 1 million gallons filled. We took it down to zero. We've established the best pipeline program in the nation, dealing predominantly with uh, gathering lines. So for Allen, we're, like I said before, we're the pilot program. And by having this as guidelines, we had about a 90% improvement on it. And when we got to the code, then we went to 98%. So, you know, I appreciate all you've done, but I, I do expect this to work. And the whole point of this with different groups is we want to have that dialogue beforehand. So it's a lot easier to tell a pipeline, hey, something culturally is significant to me. Can you please consider moving it before it's built? And it was a great experience. I appreciated everything. The only problem was it took us, what, six, seven months to get to agreement and about three years to overcome the terminology. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate everybody's help. And that's all I want to say. Thanks, Travis. And I encourage people to talk to Travis because he's a, a tribal regulator in, in, out in front of this in many ways. So we're going to take about a 15 minute break. Um, up on the screen is what's coming up next in this room and downstairs in the Royal Room. Uh, so uh, see you back here in about 15 minutes. That was a lot to try to cover in an hour. Yeah, I, I thought having eight people up here might be a problem. I was telling Sean, you know, as far as some questions, how do we yeah, I know because that was one of our arguments with 1162. Everybody was talking about how well it's working. We don't know where we start. Right. Interesting. Anyway, be an adventure for the next couple of years. I think we've watched, I, hope, I hope we can find a way to fund the evaluation. Yeah. I think we can I know, I knew that. I was making nervous. You were waiting for it. I know, yeah. Time. It's not over yet. You got two more days. I know you won't be able to replay. Like, so Purdue and U of M play oh, the Big right. Ten Championship game. Yeah. So, yeah, I did this one. I know, you can wait for that one. I told him that one was coming out. You never know. You never know. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. Well, at least here. amongst the 24 of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a start. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, now the challenge is to take it back and really make things happen. One thing we didn't make, we have a senior level involved leadership commitment, which is part of the safety management system. That's the only way this is going to work. And that's how it's worked so well with now. Well, we were purposeful on that. We didn't have nothing against communication experts. That's not going to be the problem. This needed to be leaders in each of the three days. Because that's what it's going to take. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. So let me put the two of you on the spot since I got a ballot for 1173 that I'm supposed to vote on. Yeah. Because they're just going to renew that for five years without any changes. Which kind of makes me scratch my head because they've identified things that need to be changed. And now we have this RP that should be referenced in there. So I'm tempted to vote no. Let's let's tweak it sooner than later. Yeah. Here's what I to be truthful, I don't know all the details. I don't know what the change. Yeah, I don't know all the why, you know, to your point, why not? 
Yeah, maybe they're going to, I mean, they do it for five years. I don't mean they can't change it. That's right. I, I know there was no, I believe what I hear, they had ran out of calendar because of the pandemic. And getting through, you know, we, we didn't think they probably could be able to take two to three years to do. But it took longer. So they've been meeting. There's things that still work out. They ran out. So this was a way to get an extension to, so it's not that they're stopping working on it to make it better. That, that's what I am. Yeah, I think the bid is going to start working. Exactly. exactly. That, it, 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 as soon as we can. Work. Yes, yeah. Uh, but it's a big question to ask. But that's what I remember. I got a quick update. But I, I got the same. I had to be voting on it. And they gave me you know, the basically the random calendar. And they didn't want a uh, dysfunct uh, safety man. Uh, keep what you have, but keep working on that, and that's where it was. And I, I do find they, similar to this, they tried to reach out to broad stakeholders. So the gas, uh, you know, pick on them a little bit. You know, that's an area where we need to do better implementation. How can we help them? Not a big deal for us, but it struck me strange. Maybe I just don't know enough to know what I don't know. Well, all right, I got two of them. How many you got? <laughs> I got. I have, there's, I there's a story behind these, and I can't remember what it is. It's pretty neat. The, Ad, the Admiral gave me one, and I was reading about it. And supposedly, if you have one and you show it to somebody that is supposed to have one and they don't have it with them, yeah, they got to buy, buy beer. Beers. Yeah, that's what it so, is. So, uh, that's what it is. I'm going to go show it to Jennifer. She's still here. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen her, but she did a great job. Yeah. I think she was in and out pretty quick. Yeah, this one's in and out. How'd it go, Greg? Too much for an hour. But. The whole farm. <laughs> Here you go. See, people will be cutting and pasting that out of the video and blaming you for something. <laughs> right. Right. I had worked with him because um, last year we had Pennsylvania point one regulations came up. I was like, guys, guys, we got to pay attention to this and we got to participate and comment on this. Is he going to try and weaken our fortune control standards at the state level? And they're like, oh, we do that stuff at the federal level. We don't really have a program. I'm like, this is really good. Like, you know, my regulations in Pennsylvania, and they don't do it. They're stretched too thin, too. Uh, specifically, the enforcement people at the end were trying to make the standards easier for them to enforce. That's technically accurate, but easier to enforce. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate you yeah, appreciate coming being all here. this way for two minutes. Yeah, appreciate you being here. And we're so pleased that you're here because when we started here, you were going through in May and June, it was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, your name's for real familiar, too. I don't know if we communicated or not. But, uh. Right. Did he make it? I thought his, okay, I thought his name tag was still on the table last time I looked. Hey, Graham. You, too. Did they ever figure out your PowerPoint? Yeah, because I tried it too, and it just comes up with asking. I tried your email on it, but then it wanted a password. It's like, oh, well. All right, as long as they got it. Yep. 
plug in for it next time. <laughs> What's that? Both. <laughs> yeah, I came a day early because we were supposed to have eight inches of snow on uh, Wednesday in Bellingham. So I thought, oh, I better get out on Tuesday. It turned out Tuesday was the worst day to travel <laughs> yesterday. But, uh, what we got? We got here. Oh, yeah. They don't have plows. So it's like, good luck. You too.
was just there. Yeah, that's why I thought I wasn't sure if Rebecca was going to get this going. I think it puts it wherever. Um, so, yeah, so maybe all of us uh, together. And so maybe if you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And then Dan is going to be kind of on and off. So maybe he can sit towards the edge. I um, haven't seen John. So. Maybe. <laughs> I think Rebecca was gonna all right everyone we're gonna start the next session soon if you can find your seat John, see him? Hey. I know. You're We're going to get going again, people. Find your seats, please. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I think since we only have four, we could do two on one side, two on the other. And Dan will be up and off the stage, so he can maybe have one of the outside seats. Is my computer in your way? No. No. Okay. Is this the clicker? Yeah. We don't have a time. Is anyone else going? Are no. you going to sit here when uh, you're not speaking? Or are you going to um, be at the podium? Level? Actually, yes, that's a good idea because Dan is going to come up here and talk, I think. So, yeah. There's Rebecca. All right, everyone, if you can find your seats, we're going to start the next panel. We're already running behind, so people are going to want lunch. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll be good. We'll be quick. <laughs> All right. Welcome to the next panel. Uh, we are today talking about CO2 pipeline safety regulations. This is an extremely emerging topic. Um, you know, we... Uh, the Pipeline Safety Trust kind of got involved after uh, the gassing of Satarsha article written by Dan Ziegart. We are going to hear from him in a little bit. But uh, in addition, the 45Q tax credit expansion, as well as the Inflation Re Reduction Act, really kind of uh, set this off in motion. And the Pipeline Safety Trust has been uh, working diligently to get caught up to speed on uh, carbon dioxide pipelines, the regulations, the safety risks, 
Um, after Dan's article, uh, Pipeline Safety Trust commissioned a report um, from an independent pipeline safety expert um, to really look at the, the regulatory gaps and the safety issues of carbon dioxide pipelines. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what that report highlighted today. Um, but let me first introduce myself. Uh, I've been introduced a little bit before, but my name's Amanda McKay. I'm the program manager for the Pipeline Safety Trust. I started in April of this year. So I think potentially out of everyone in the room, I might be the newest to pipeline safety, minus Erin, but she's downstairs. Um, so you know, when I was doing my interview for PST, uh, there was a section that they gave me an option of potential topics to, top up, to talk about, to talk through, to see if I could uh, critically think about the, the issues that PST was working on. And one of the options was CO2 pipelines. Uh, and I had never heard of CO2 pipelines. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, and so they showed the video that we're about to show um, in a minute here. They showed me that video and it opened up my eyes about the extreme safety risks um, and the potential devastation that CO2 pipelines uh, can have on, on communities as we've seen. Um, so that really opened my eyes and it actually was pretty much the reason that I wanted to start working for the Pipeline Safety Trust. Um, it's such an important topic, and it's one that seems to be on the forefront of everyone's mind right now. So I'm really happy to have all of our panelists here today to talk about this issue, um, and especially uh, honored to have Dan Ziegart, the author of the Gassing of Satarsha article that really opened everyone's eyes um, to this topic. So um, I think that we're going to have a really great discussion here today. And um, first, we are going to hear from Dan about the Satarsha incident. So Dan, if you'd like to come up. Oh, uh, let's move to the next slide. green button advances okay okay uh first of all i want to say it's a great uh pleasure to be here with folks who are interested in pipeline safety uh <clears throat> i was spent a lot of time in mississippi um in 2020 uh in this little town of satarsha which if you looked for a better example of a tiny little american hamlet uh that's beautiful and bucolic and uh in a beautiful place with great people, not a lot of people, uh, only about 50 people or so live in this little town and about 200 or 300 around it. You couldn't find a better candidate than this town. And uh, I have to admit, as a journalist, uh, you can't be objective about this one. <laughs> it's a beautiful place and that's all there is to it. Um, we're here to talk about sort of the individual impacts of the human impacts on actual people of what is being planned for us in other places in Washington and now uh, very, very almost frenetically among um, the uh, oil and gas and, uh, and other uh, people who want to build uh, CCS and build pipelines. And we all know there's a good reason to worry about sequestering carbon. It's a good thing to be a good thing to do. But this is what happened. Um, uh, in this little town in, on, in February of uh, 2020. Uh, and it's about, as I said, uh, maybe 300 people altogether involved in this, but um, it was a sort of an ordinary Saturday night. Folks, a lot of folks had gone off to a, um, a baby shower or a, an event uh, up in near, nearby Yazoo City. So there weren't as many people in the town as, as there might have been, but this all started at about 706 is when the uh 706 p.m on this saturday in february uh could we play the um uh, and when it, within a few minutes of the leak which is when that happened uh they started getting in 713 they started getting 911 calls this was one of the first calls could we play that 
please. After the emergency location of the emergency. Um, I am like five minutes off of Highway 3, um, on, on Highway 433 from Highway 3. My friend, she's laying on the ground and she's shaking. She's kind of drooling out of the mouth. I don't know if she's having a seizure or not. You need somebody to okay, baby. Is this in Satarsha area? Yes. Okay, what kind of vehicle are you in? I am in a blue Honda Accord. It stopped in the middle of the road. In the road. Okay, so you are on 43, close to Highway 3, correct? Yes. All right, how old is she? How old is she? 22. Okay, is she still convulsing at this time? Yes. Okay, what is a good phone number for you, just in case I lose connection with you? 262 Okay, can you want to just stay calm for me? I've got help. Is there anything we can do right now? I'm going to help you with that, okay? Tell me exactly what had happened. Well, I don't know what's going on up the road, but it was like like I was driving, and I ran into like a lot of fumes. Like, it's a lot of noise going on, and like I couldn't see anything. My car went back up. Like, I don't know what's going on. And it was like strong fumes coming up. I had to cover my nose to get out of the car. I don't know if she covered hers or not. That could be one thing. And my, okay. my, my, my chest is hurting really bad. Okay. But could you really get somebody, like, quick? Wait, hard. I've got help. Baby, I have help coming to you right now. Are you with her right now? Yes. It's, it's four of us. There's four of you? Okay. Is anybody else having any chest pain or anything like that with the fumes? Is anybody else having chest pain? Is this okay. No, ma'am. Everybody else is fine. Okay. Is she awake right now? Yes, ma'am. Her eyes is open. Okay. And is she breathing? Yes. All right, sweetie. We have an ambulance that's been dispatched out. I'm just going to ask a couple of quick questions. Okay. All right? Okay. This is not slowing them down at all. Has she had more than one seizure in a row? I, I, I don't know her. She's a friend of a friend. Okay, well, since you've been there with her, has she had more than one? No, ma'am. I, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Is she pregnant or has she been pregnant in the last four weeks that you're aware of? I, no, ma'am. Okay. And if you don't know any of these questions, that's perfectly fine. Do you or anyone there know if she's a diabetic? Ma'am? Do you or... Okay. So, thanks for... for, uh, for listening to that because that's that's a that's a very especially the beginning part still scares me um so this is a woman who's up on a little hill on on the road that runs across this hill and then comes down into the valley where satarsha is in that in this uh that's the azu river and this woman is calling she at the time that this happened was probably within a, a few hundred yards judging by what we learned later of where the where the break actually took place, and there's a huge, you know, as you saw, initial release, and this woman and some of those people in the car evidently were in it. Her car stalled, um, went uh, dead. The engine went dead, which is what happens when you're in a cloud of carbon dioxide. It deprives it of uh, of oxygen. You can't have burn fuel without oxygen. Anyway, um, and. It, the other thing that's illustrative about this, aside from the fact that her car died and therefore she couldn't get out, was that the ambulance actually had to go somewhere else to meet her um, because they couldn't get up on that hill either. They would have conked out. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot said about how you can deal with that problem if there is such an event again. Uh, one of the companies said they were going to buy electric. Uh, this is out in the Midwest where they're building these ethanol pipelines. They promised them uh, electric fire trucks. Uh, but it turns out on closer inspection, there's only one electric fire truck, and it's in Canada. Uh, so I think that's going to be difficult. Um, anyway, so here you have a situation where uh, you have folks who are stranded in their homes. They, by and large, many people could not be evacuated. They had to self-evacuate. As they drove out of town, they suffered a range of uh, of uh, uh, of health effects. But the, the most immediate thing that happened was as this plume descended and it came down very quickly at about 7 p.m. People just went unconscious, bang, one after another, about two dozen people. 
uh, passed out within about three minutes of that initial release. Um, you know that from tracking uh, a lot of people who were there and just figuring out where people were at what time and what happened to them. Uh, so that's the first thing. But these were sublethal exposures. So they woke up again. Later on, we'll take a quick look at this Lake Nyos incident where people did not get up again. 1,700 of them never got up again. Um, that was a CO2 incident as well. Anyway, what this revealed was, um, as you could tell, the caller had no idea what she was driving through. Um, the dispatcher also had no idea what the gas was that she was dealing with. They had not been informed by the company that there had been a leak at this point uh, of, of the CO2 pipeline. And they were guessing, trying to figure out what the heck it was. And so what they were telling people was that it was natural gas. It just illustrates the level of confusion and fear that people felt when all of a sudden people are going unconscious around them, getting sick and throwing up and all sorts of things, and no one knows what it is. You have to put yourself in that position to understand why the people in that community are still afraid and some still have trouble going to sleep at night. And so it was a really, when you had, universally, the question that I asked was, how does this rate in your uh, experiences? Uh, and to a, to a person, everyone said, uh, this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. People called their spouses uh, to say goodbye. So I'm giving you all this personal detail because it's, it's, this is the part that's lacking. Um, one, what happens in, in, in the event of an actual explosive rupture. Two, what physical effects this gas can have on people, um, many of which have not been studied. I interviewed a, a well-known emergency uh, room doctor, a, a guy who um, uh, actually travels from hospital to hospital in Europe and advises them on procedures. And he had written a paper on CO2. And I said, well, what got you interested in CO2? And he said, I'm not interested in CO2. Nobody's interested in CO2. Because it's, it's not a glamorous thing to study because this type of thing has been basically unheard of. Um, people don't pass out every day walking down the street from carbon dioxide. So it's not a phenomenon that we really know much about. And the folks who went through this, who went through the worst of it, still, to this day, some of them have serious health concerns. I'm not just talking about, and I'm not trivializing them, I'm not just talking about PTSD and, um, you know, emotional issues. I'm talking about continued uh, reduction of lung capacity, uh, continued headaches, uh, confusion, and in the case of three of the people who, who were in a car for four hours breathing is completely unconscious and who were rescued, according to the fire people who rescued them, uh, just on the brink of death, um, that these are folks who lived through long, sublethal exposures to this gas, and there were serious consequences. The, the companies that want to build pipelines want to say that, and they've, they've continued to say, there were no injuries in this incident, um, which is just so disrespectful to what happened uh, and to the people it happened to. There were serious injuries. There were overnight hospitalizations, which the company, Denbury, which uh, operated the pipeline, had insisted did not happen. Um, there were people who were in the hospital for a week afterwards. And then this, these three gentlemen who suffered this very long period of exposure who uh, are still sick. One of them is with us today, and he's going to be speaking on several panels. Uh, and uh, Debray, would you stand up for just a minute and just say, just let folks see you? This is, uh, this is, uh, this is Debray Burns, uh, who, uh, who survived this, who was in a car. Uh, uh, right near the explosion, within 500 feet of it. And what they heard was a roaring like a jet engine. And then bang, the lights went out. Um, there's cars stalled and out they went. I'll let Debray tell his story. He's gonna tell it um, to, uh, I think, a couple of the panels here today. But anyway, so there's a living, sur a living survivor who went through this, who's still having uh, health problems. These are documented. Um, I've seen some of the medical records. We've talked to his uh, people who are taking care of him. And we know quite a bit about these three gentlemen who were all in the car together. And it's not a pretty picture. So if you think about long COVID, 
you could say these people have long CO2 exposure uh, symptoms. They are, they are the long haulers uh, of this particular incident, and they would be, continue to be uh, people like this if there were other uh, releases that affected uh, communities. So this is the thing. You have a first of its kind incident. World Health Organization confirmed to us that there had never been a uh, massive this, uh, release of CO2 uh, from uh, anthropogenic, uh, uh, anthropogenic CO2, meaning CO2 that was being handled by human beings and moved through a pipeline. Uh, this is the first time it happened. And yet we're plunging ahead with a program to build who knows how many miles of these things. We're plunging ahead in, in, Ohio, in Iowa, uh, in Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Illinois are all involved with these three massive pipelines that will be ethanol pipelines. Um, and uh, it's caused a huge sort of social upheaval in the states that are affected and the counties that are affected with people who are just not willing to allow this to happen. How will they stop it? I don't know. But the combination of taking people's land who are farmers and can't just pick up and relocate uh, and the now better publicized safety risks, uh, I have to wrap it up here, has resulted in the situation we have today. Anyway, I could easily talk for another 10 hours, which would really be a, uh, an unfortunate thing for everyone here probably. <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I wanted to say that I really appreciate uh, Bill Karam and uh, Amanda and Aaron Murphy and all the other folks who put this together, all the people who were here, whether from industry, uh, government, or uh, we have a lot of work to do, folks. That's all I have to say. And uh, I, I hope you'll hear what DeBray has to say at, at one of the panels. We can try and figure out exactly where he's going to be today and get that information out to people. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to tell you a little bit more about what happened in Satarsha. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we just so appreciate you being here. Uh, like we've said so many times, but it can never be said enough. Uh, I don't think we would be talking about this without you. So thank you. Um, so now we're going to move into kind of the panel panel discussion topic. Um, I will sort of briefly introduce our panelists um, and then give you guys each a chance to give yourself a little bit of a deeper introduction and how you're, um, you individually are working on CO2 pipeline safety. So we'll start with uh, John Studi of the Liquid Energy Pipelines Association, if you want to start. Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, my name's uh, John Studi, and uh, pleasure to be here. Several uh, conferences so far, and uh, really enjoy coming to share what industry is uh, doing on pipelines. I lead our organization's safety program efforts, and we work across the industry on practices we heard uh, before, recommendations, standards, how to operate pipelines more safely, and how to uh, make sure incidents like this don't happen again. I think I'll start with the conclusion, or do you want us to give our two minutes now or just redoing introductions? Um, just the, yeah, yeah, two minutes of kind of okay. what you're working on. Uh, I'll start at the end, which is what I want everyone to walk out of this room thinking. And that's the main question is, will Satarsha bring positive change? And the answer is yes. So a few points on that specifics. Uh, industry recognizes the need to improve CO2 pipeline safety. One of the things that we did, uh, is in, there's been mentioned, is uh, the trust put out a report on, uh, on with safety recommendations. And one of my roles leading our safety programs, we have a CO2 pipeline safety uh, group. We actually went through every single one of those recommendations. And we thought about them when we looked at the regulations and we looked at our operations. And we agree with the need to do uh, most of those regulations. We don't agree with all of them. I'll just be honest up front. But uh, uh, more than the majority, we agree with. So we that brings me to the second uh, point, which is 
we are and will take action to improve pipeline safety, CO2 pipeline operation, construction, and emergency response. And we have work groups underway. We can uh, talk more about that later, especially on how best to respond to the unique needs of a CO2 pipeline. And then third is uh, our role as a national trade association is to bring the national perspective on pipelines. And there are about 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines across the US. They've actually been operating for over 40 years, uh, mostly out west, uh, some this one in uh, Pennsylvania. And when you look at the incident safety data on PHMSA publicly available, PHMSA incident uh, database, the overall national record of CO2 pipelines is positive. And they are actually one of the safest pipeline systems when you compare them to crude oil or refined products. Uh, so that's what the data says. Now, going back to the beginning, do we need to do better? Yes, and we'll talk about how are, and what are the specific actions we'll be taking and uh, working with uh, partners on to try and make CO2 pipelines safer. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next we have Max Kiba, he is from FIMSA. Um, and I just wanna take an opportunity to recognize FIMSA uh, announcing their rulemaking, future rulemaking on CO2, updating the CO2 pipeline safety regulations. Um, I think that that's uh, really important to recognize that FIMSA took that uh, proactive approach, um, although there may be some uh, restraints and hurdles to jump over in that process. Um, it's it's really great to see. And um, yeah, Max, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Max Kiba, is this on yet? Uh, Max Kiba with um, FEMSA. Currently in program development, the best way I can describe my division currently is kind of the nexus of policy, data, and technical, which can be a very dangerous but also fun place to be in in the agency, but a longtime engineer. And I will say I'm an extension of probably about 12 to 15 roughly informal team members. FEMSA's got a big team culture, and we've got folks in regs looking at these issues, legal or regional folks. As an extension, we have some state folks that are here, but also looking at it as well from different angles as well. So I'm um, one person, but again, I represent a team of um, many great individuals. A lot of new folks looking at from different angles. Do we need to be um, a new look at this as well? So. Um, mostly on the technical and the FEMSA side. I'll talk in some of the um, questions about our statutory authorities, what regulatory authorities we currently have, and other ways we lean forward of, you know, again, our, our mission is safety, so how we focus on safety first. So. All right. Thank you, Max. And then finally, we have Paul Blackburn with uh, Bold Alliance. Thanks, Amanda. And yeah, my name is Paul Blackburn. I'm an attorney. I work for the Bold Alliance. And you know, it's really great to be back in this conference. I used to be a board member of the Pipeline Safety Trust. Um, so probably, I don't know how many of you know who I am. Um, I did the initial strategic targeting for Keystone and Keystone Excel. I was involved in Sandpiper. You probably remember that went down. Um, I uh, have been involved in Line 3, um, DAPL, and quite a number of other pipelines, and been in, in, been in the council in quite a number of regulatory proceedings. So what is my job? In some ways, it's very simple. My job is to find a lack of integrity and highlight it. So that's really what I do. Now, there's lots of different kinds of lack of integrity. There's a lack of integrity in the Pipeline Safety Act itself. There's a lack of integrity in the Inflation Reduction Act, that's for sure. There's a lack of integrity within the regulations. There's a lack of integrity within the implementation and enforcement. There's many kinds of lack of integrity. And there's also probably the most important integrity in all the, the, of all of these is the personal integrity of people who are working in the field. That's, without that, nothing else really matters. And I just want to say that you know, I recognize that there are people with tremendous integrity whose you know, jobs are there to protect thousands and thousands of people. And they do their jobs extremely well and I deeply respect their efforts. At the same time, there's also a significant lack of integrity with regard to a lot of engagement with the public. And with regard to CO2 pipelines, this is going to be a new experience for all of you that are involved in this. I mean, I've been working on this for over a decade and the level of public in interest intensity 
is just an order of magnitude different, at least. So, you know, as we go into this, um, realize, and these aren't necessarily, this is not the green community either, at least the Midwest. You know, this is landowners, so they're treating this extremely differently. We even have farm bureaus being opposed to some of these pipelines. That is, that is just earth shattering in a political sense. So, you know, we're, this is going to be a new experience for everybody. And, um, you know, some people are here to, to, you know, we're all here to try to be productive together. At the same time, you realize that there is a stick and that stick is out there. Now, with regard to, for example, the airline industry, I think the reason that that is so much, there's so much safety there is it's so public. And the airline industry has to be aware of the risks and people are very aware when those big planes go over and they come down pipelines are hidden. And that means that, you know, the industry sometimes likes to keep it hidden. And then when things go bad, the, the difference between how people are feeling about the pipeline industry and the, you know, there's a lack of necess there's often a lack of, I think, responding appropriately to the, to the, to the bad things that do happen. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. All right, so um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we'll try and keep these answers um, short and concise while still diving into the topic. But I was hoping, Max, that you could start us off with sort of describing the current state of existing CO2 pipeline infrastructure. Yeah, so currently, based on our data, um, at least as of last night, we have about approximately 5,300 5, miles of CO2 pipelines out there, uh, roughly 8 to 20 inches in diameter. Most of these uh, historically done for enhanced oil recovery. So kind of the different aspect of what were some of these projects we're seeing now that are looking at um, certainly carbon capture, um, supporting ethanol plants, biofuels. I don't have pressures on these, but most of them, if anyone doesn't know, we hear, you might hear in the regulations talking about supercritical CO2. So basically that has to be above roughly 87.8 to 88 Fahrenheit, and then also above about 1070 PSI. So most of these are going to be running between 1000 and 2000 PSI uh, temperature wise. Um, again, if, if they're in super critical, I have heard some of these newer projects, there might be portions that might be below one of those points from a temperature aspect. So, but again, we're, and most of them, the enhanced oil right now are in North Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, actually not one, not too terribly far away from Louisiana that gets into the one that uh, went through Sestarsha. The newer projects are in some new areas. So uh, Iowa, South Dakota, Illinois, Nebraska, uh, Minnesota, North Dakota is also in there as well. So I think in general, it's a lot of folks learning about these, um, both us on this new approach to CO2, but also certainly out in the public as well. So. Great. Thanks, Max. Yep. Um, Paul, on to you, hoping that uh, somewhat briefly, you can describe the safety risks and regulatory gaps of these pipelines that we kind of alluded to earlier. Sure. And I, th I think that I first off to start with, I think most of you have seen the pipeline safety trust paper that Richard Cooperwitz authored, um, uh, you know, on the different kinds of uh, issues that are outstanding. Um, and we could go into a lot of detail at all those issues. Um, you know, I, I think that the you know, to start with, there's jurisdictional issues. You know, how, which pipelines are covered? You know, these pipelines, we know the operating temperatures have been released in some of the PSC, and some of the uh, applications to the regulators. And many of them are going to be operating, at least for parts of them, below supercritical, the critical point, the critical temperature. Um, but there's also questions about, well, where's the jurisdictional boundary on the, um, up on, on the on the sequestration side or the enhanced oil recovery side, enhanced oil recovery is a bit clear. But on the sequestration side, where does the where does FEMSA's jurisdiction end? Um, there's you know issues like the odorants. Um, there's uh, issues of like one of the things that that citizens are extremely concerned about is what's the danger zone? You know what's the zone of hazard around this? If you look at Satarsha, the rupture was. Um, one mile as a crow flies from downtown Satarsha, or the center of Satarsha, like downtown. Um, but if you look at the way the CO2 must have flowed through the topography, it's more like 1.3 miles. Well, that was a 9.5 miles of pipeline release, a 24-inch pipeline. Um, you know, the regulations right now are 15 in HCAs and 20 miles in other places. So you could be looking at double the release in different locations. 
well, what's the, what's the danger zone? We don't have regulations on that. And can it be estimated? Yes, but probably more on the basis of computational fluid dynamic modeling because it's going to be heavily dependent on topography and weather and other conditions. And there's a great deal of concern and questions about this. You know, we've heard um, first responders say, you know, I'm not going to go into these clouds. I'm not going to go respond because I don't know anything about this, this, hat, this risk. Um, you know, that's a problem, you know, but it's also legitimate. In the same time, you know, we've got you know, the companies who are proposing these refusing to disclose their models. They may not have done any modeling yet. Um, but, you know, why is that? Well, they say that's because they don't have to do the models because FEMSA doesn't require it, at least not until the emergency response plans are done, you know, after the pipeline starts operations. Well, why not release the model? Why not provide the models now? Why not develop a regulatory structure that can actually estimate the danger zone in a reasonable way around these pipelines? It's a great, you know, people want to know that. They want to know it. You know, um, we've got issues with uh, a lot of misunderstanding about people, about the industry saying that, that uh, local states and governments don't have control over routing, that they can't consider safety in routing. You know, which is we've got four federal cases right now um, on preemption issues. We'll talk about that later. You know, so but those the basic question of of you know what's what is the danger zone and, and can anybody keep a pipeline away from you know high consequence facilities? And there again, you know, the high consequence liquid pipeline high consequence areas are all defined primarily for the purpose of oil. You know, not for the purpose of CO two. Most of the factors for high consequence areas don't apply to CO2 pipelines. So we don't really have any guidance or regulation on you know, what should be considered a high consequence area. And you know, just to sort of wrap this up, one of the things about airlines is airplanes when they go down, it tends to be a mass, mass casualty incident. Pretty much everybody dies. You know, generally speaking, there haven't been that many of those for oil and, oil and natural gas. But with CO2, there's the potential for there to be mass casualty incidents. You know, the CO2 pipeline is gonna go in new kinds of areas from emitters to uh, sequestration to hubs to sequestration areas and hand recovery. You know, they're gonna be going through much more densely populated areas. So, you know, the urgent need for understanding what high consequence is and to figure out how to route these around high consequence areas such as nursing homes and schools and hospitals, how do we do that? And how do we make sure that the public knows that they're going to be kept safe from these pipelines? So we'll leave it there. Thanks, Paul. And uh, did want to point out that in addition to the report we have online, we also have uh, sort of a media backgrounder that summarizes it, as well as a document called uh, regulatory and knowledge gaps that sort of summarizes all of those. So those can be found on our website. Um, I'd like to open it up to everyone for this question, but maybe starting with Max, um, just really talking about how does the potential build out of these CO2 pipelines interface with the regulatory shortfalls, given that FIMSA has announced a rulemaking to update these regulations? So, uh, um, so first, my lawyers will say I can't tell you anything that's in the rule. Uh, we have ex parte requirements, so I can't tell you what's actually in the rule, but I think it's fair to say what we put out publicly in addition to the, um, um, sorry, the, the information of the rulemaking, emerging preparedness was a big, big miss on this, um, knowing what was there, the public engagement piece of it. And I think we've said publicly, we're at least looking there for sure. Uh, we've also done a launched a bunch of uh, our um, R&D projects. There's at least three ongoing right now. One is, is looking at uh, PIR, a potential impact radius for CO2. There's others um, looking at um, aspects like welding and some of those aspects. Um, so that's also uh, some R&D we have in place now that's uh, ongoing. We also put out the failure investigation report if you haven't seen it. Um, and I will say we are encouraging as much as possible others to look at that so we can all learn about it. Um, getting away from the old culture of, okay, something just happened with that particular operator incident. It can't possibly happen to us. Um, versus, yes, this, this is an industry issue, and yes, um, it is partly a regulatory issue looking at it. Um, in the meantime, I will say also, uh, I'll touch on our statutory authority. So we do have statutory authority for CO2 pipelines. That includes gaseous, liquid, and supercritical. 
We only have currently regulatory authority for the supercritical I talked about. So our statutory authority, where they're talking gaseous, even some of these pipelines that are talking about playing the games with the temp, not playing the games, but there might be operational considerations for temperatures. We still have the authority to um, investigate any safety issues that may come up if these pipelines happen. So while we're, it does take a long time for regulations to happen, but we still have some, again, statutory authorities that we can, we can um, implement. So hopefully that gives a little high level. I will say um, I talked about states. So one challenge FEMSA has is we don't have siting authority of any kind. So we can't say whether a pipeline happens or not. If it happens, it's gotta be done mm -hmm. safely. We will certainly do technical support. If a siting authority asks us to uh, give input, we will. A lot of these are being handled at the state and local issues at a county level. But I will say our states, even if they don't have liquid authority under our certifications, if anyone doesn't know, um, states have authorities. Most states have authority for gas uh, pipelines. There's a smaller list of liquid authority on pipelines. But I will say even states that don't have authority, South Dakota is one of them, that they are learning more about CO2. They are getting engaged in some of these um, reviews at a state and local level. So they're getting involved, even though again, they don't have the authority per se, they are still getting involved at that level. So again, as an extension of FEMSA, um, I like to say we have 600 inspectors, that's 200 roughly FEMSA. We have about 400 state inspectors. So there are some of our state folks that are looking at it as well. So again, while we're waiting around for these semantics, some semantics, I agree there are some unique risks we have to look at, but definitions, things like that, we do still have authorities that we can put into place to make sure things are done safely. Thanks for that. I think it's also just important putting on my PST hat here to point out the statutory limitations that FIMSA is under. Um, you know, the, the legacy clause that, uh, you know, you can't put, uh, once a pipeline is a gr in the ground, new regulations uh, won't, you know, might not apply to that. And then also the unique cost benefit analysis that FIMSA is under. So uh, just as Max said, regulations take a long time and there are also a lot of uh, difficult hurdles and, and jump uh, hoops to jump through. So yeah. Yeah, Paul? You know, years ago I was in a hearing at a county level and the, we had a lot of people there and the county commissioner looked out and said, you know, sometimes we do this easy and sometimes we do this right. This time we're gonna do it right. You know, and I think that that's the situation here where the, the amount of interest and intensity around these, around these pipelines is gonna require that the industry really do this right. You know, when the regu one, of the, one of the lack of integrities within the regulations is that when, you know, went back in, was it 1991, when, CO2 pipelines are first regulated, you know, FEMSIT and the industry, an API recommendation just simply added the words and, CO, and carbon dioxide everywhere in the, in the, in the oil and gas pipe, oh, the oil pipeline regulations that has liquid pipeline regulations. You know, and there were some rational reasons for that. But now we're talking about build out, you know, the conservative numbers, I think, from places like Princeton and the Great Plains Institute are like 60,000 miles of new pipelines. But if you look at those maps, they're all assuming centralized planning with a rational structure, you know, which is just not happening. These pipelines are being developed commercially and so they're overlapping. They're gonna be, you know, crisscrossing each other like crazy if they all get built out. We'd be talking, you know, many more miles than 60 or 70,000 miles of pipe. Further, unlike the oil and gas industry, which grew organically, you know, this entire industry is based on in federal tax credits, you know, and that means that it's being driven extremely quickly. The Inflation Reduction Act was so phenomenally, phenomenally generous to the point of being, I think, theft of public dollars that it's just going to drive this industry much faster than any than the oil and gas industry have ever been driven to, to expand. And we know, you know, the engineering things, you know, quick, fast or cheap or sorry, um, you know, cheap, good or fast <laughs> and, you know, pick two. Um, there's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure to uh, make these pipelines quickly and to bring this industry into place quickly. Um, it's, it's going to be a very different regulatory and development environment than anything that's ever happened in the pipeline industry before. Thanks, Paul. John? 
Thanks. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the gaps and I'll hit on them uh, too. And that was a great service the trust did to highlight those. But I wanted to talk about, and people are probably asking, what are the regulations that are covering CO2 pipelines? And what do they cover? Are there a few? Are there a lot? And I made a list of, uh, uh, and I'll go through quickly. It, you look in the regulations, the jargon is uh, 49 CFR 195, but there are different parts and they're in uh, categories that you might imagine. Design requirements for internal design pressure, fracture propagation, that's if there's a crack in the steel, installation of new pipe, leak detection systems. Uh, there are construction requirements, they call those subpart D for material inspection, pipeline location, welds and testing, cover over buried pipe, regulations on clearance between pipeline and underground structures, regulations on the location of valves. Uh, PHMSA regulates CO2 pipelines for pressure testing, what test pressures you have to use. Uh, they require operations and maintenance regulations, procedural manuals for operations, emergency response training, maximum operating pressure, regulations on reliable communications, regulations on inspecting in the right of way. PHMSA regulates extreme weather events, inspections after those, leak detection systems, and then integrity management, the inspection and maintenance of pipelines. So there is a lot, there are many, many, many requirements on the books now. So the next question, well, is it enough? And the answer is no, there are gaps. And we've uh, talked about uh, a handful of those. And we agree that uh, we need to update the definition of CO2 pipelines in FIMSA regs to extend to gas. Uh, we agree we need more uh, both to uh, study the modeling and then get them into operator plans on the impact areas and the unique nature of CO2 pipelines, how it follows the topography and it's very conditional on weather atmospheric conditions. Uh, fracture propagation, there are there is existing a specific regulation in the FIMSA code on uh, consideration of fracture propagation when it's under construction, but then not under operation. So we'd be supportive of adding something there. Odorant is an issue. We talked about the smell. That's a technical issue that, you know, how uh, uh, natural gas smells like rotten eggs when you uh, smell it in the house. Well, that chemical won't work for CO2. And so they need to find a different one. And the, the engineers are working on that now. And then we definitely agree on increasing coordination with uh, local emergency responders. And to that, I'll just finish with what are some of the actions that we're doing now? Because one dynamic we face, and it's not unique to FEMSA across the federal government, it takes years to put new regulations in a process, into place. There's a process, notice to the public, receiving comment from the public, making changes to those and so industry is not waiting. We're not sitting back. We are now working on recommended practices, the best practices for operators on emergency response, uh, how to do that type of modeling, how to incorporate that type of modeling into your emergency response plans, how to reach out to your local first responders, which they already do generally for pipelines, but specific to CO2. And then how can we help first responders to know how to respond in an incident? Industry currently uh, funds uh, online free training for local first responders. Any first responder in your communities can go online and receive that training for free on how to respond to a pipeline incident. And we plan to add how to respond to a CO2 pipeline incident in the future to provide that resource for free for uh, first responders. So there's a lot uh, going on. I'm, Glad you chose CO2 pipelines uh, because it's uh, it's an important area where there's a, a lot that's uh, getting better and uh, uh, we'll look forward to uh, the trust is uh, work in this area. Great, thank you. All right, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions because I'm sure that there are a good amount of questions, um, but kind of just wanted to think about what what's the path forward? What does the path forward look like? And I'm glad you kind of talked about what the industry is thinking about um, on the path forward. But Max specifically was wondering if you can talk about uh, some of the complexities that FIMSA will have to address and navigate um, with the future expanded regulation. I have to be careful here. So when you say regulation, again, ex parte, I can't uh, say what we're putting in the rulemaking. Um, but I will say for the project reviews, we are um, 
definitely look at some of these aspects. Um, plume modeling was mentioned as an example. So <clears throat> certainly the uh, high consequence area applications in these project reviews, we look at how they do their analysis. And I think it was mentioned, most of CO2 right now is in part 195, but when it gets released, it turns into a gas. So what we're trying to you know, lean folks on is um, you know, use hazardous liquid integrity management on the liquid side, but also when it's released, consider the aspects certainly of gas integrity management, people, dwellings, things like that, uh, valve closure times. And by the way, we just recently issued a valve rule that does apply to CO2 as well. So while we have a number of rulemakings that are in play, that while we're waiting for the overall CO2, we have others um, that we are making sure these um, operators look at. Um, public engagement to me is a big piece. It was mentioned earlier. Um, um, respect was mentioned earlier. And that, that's one of my personal core values. And that's what gets me disappointed is when I find out the operators talk a good game about you know, notifying the public, uh, public awareness was brought up. Some people try to point out that technically it's in our operations and maintenance portion of the code, so it may not necessarily apply to construction. But if the first time the public and the uh, first responders are finding out about a pipeline is when there's an incident, that's way too late. So as much as possible, engage with the public at the siting side. And again, we don't have siting authority, but as much as possible on the siting side, the construction side, actively listening, which we don't always do all the time, just finding out what the concerns are, what you want to learn about um, for CO2. That's what we try to encourage operators to do. Um, the public engagement RP was talked about is a, you know, could be a good thing, but it might take a while. So while we're waiting for that, you know, again, engagement piece is a big part. Um, looking at some of the other aspects, a lot of R&D is ongoing. Um, I mentioned some of them, but Things like purity of um, even supercritical state, a lot of concerns come up if, with the purity of whether it's the 90%, which is in our definition, but sometimes if there's water content that comes in, things like that, the materials have to be compatible. And I think our aspect, and it was mentioned too, with the shift from these enhanced oil recovery that were in certain areas, but now you are talking, you're hearing about these CO2 hubs that are going to be uh, talked about with much more expansive, and I agree with probably, I've, I've seen numbers too on the order of, you know, so we're going from 5,300 to potentially 60 to 100,000 miles that some believe it needs to happen to get to this um, net zero or on our path towards net zero. Um, so again, it is, you're talking much more infrastructure, um, much more mileage, much more complex operations. So you're hearing some of these that they may not just be in super critical, they may be gas portions, they may be liquid portions and others. So um, some of those are coming up in project reviews as well. So, because um, those are some of our actions, and we and we will be serious when there's incidents that happen. I mean, Satarsha, you might see numbers out there that there were no injuries. Injuries, by certain definitions, are if they required overnight hospitalizations. But there were a number of people evacuated in this incident. For at least 45 individuals uh, were went to the hospital, um, and then we're hearing long-term effects as well. So I think there's acknowledgement this could have been a heck of a lot worse. Um, so hopefully um, you've, you've seen our leadership will take action if we need to. With, we did a press release in May. Uh, we, we put a pretty darn hefty fine, I should say proposed fine, because there is a process where the operator can still uh, have a hearing to talk about that. But um, So we will lean forward again if there are issues um, we're trying to learn about it as much as possible. So hopefully that kind of answers a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. We can get as many of those as possible. Um, so if we have our mics running around. Um, yeah, come back up. This is a question for Max, uh, Chuck Lesniak um, uh, from Texas. Uh, you know, given what Paul's talking about, what you all are talking about with the rapid expansion of these CO2 pipelines around the country, this sounds to me like either one of two things need to happen is one, a moratorium on new pipelines, CO2 pipelines, or an emergency rulemaking, because it's clear that the rules are inadequate. And so what authority in either of those areas does either FEMSA or the secretary have um, or the White House have to do either one of those things? Because something needs to happen. We're not prepared for this, clearly. And this is coming fast. Uh, that leans heavily into policy. I see Alan in the back. I, the moratorium on pipelines can get more problematic, I believe. And Alan, please correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I will say there are thoughts of, do we need to accelerate that rule? At least the NPRM that is scheduled, I believe currently 2024, where I believe there are talks about seeing if we can move it up with a bunch of other high priority rulemakings we have. So Alan, do you mind talking anything about the policy questions? Yeah, this is Alan. Related to the, the siting issue, um, you know, that our focus is, I think Max had indicated earlier, it is pipeline safety, but to the pipeline safety policy side, I can assure you we're taking a hard look at CO2 regulations and we're going to go where we need to go to address the gaps because we recognize there are some. Um, the matter of when that occurs, I think we can look at uh, as we go forward, but we realize and it's high on our priority to address. Um, but as you know, these things take time because of the process we have. Well, there are different tools we have, such as direct final rule, interim final rule, or the standard notice and comment. But we'll we'll take a look at all those, see where we need to go. Yeah, and and I'll say in terms of the, you know, there's already been a proposal for moratorium, and and you know we understand that FEMSA has limited jurisdiction that way, but counties and states don't. You know, we have a, a number of moratoria proposed in in South Dakota. Um, other states, other counties are considering moratoria. Uh, you know, because they see these lack of the lack of um, adequate regulations, and their citizens are just simply concerned about that. So they're they're calling for moratorium, and certainly counties we believe can do that as as can states. So this may not be a matter of you know if, but when and where. Um, and you know that is a very rational response to a situation where there's simply a lack of regulation. Uh, for some of these pipelines, and particularly, like for example, the gaseous CO2 pipelines, um, you know, we're also seeing, for example, uh, emergency response folks developing their own impact zone rules right now. You know, they're figuring out their own back of the envelope models. Some of them are more sophisticated. Some of them are looking at scientific papers. Um, but the industry is potentially facing, you know, a raft of. And this is not uh, something that, you know, Bold is pushing for these models. These folks are looking at this situation, seeing the risk, and developing their own responses to it. And to the extent that that starts becoming diversified all over the country, the industry could be faced with multiple standards and multiple jurisdictions all over the country. So there's a very, uh, I think, a big incentive to figure this stuff out with plume, plume dispersion modeling. Um, you know, it's going to come. It's not a question of when it's, it's going to be, it's going to come, it's going to be developed. And the question is how chaotically it's, it's developed. So um, just to be aware that the, there is a great deal of citizen involvement and, and concern about this. You know, one of the things we didn't, that, that Dan didn't touch on as much uh, is the first responder response to the, the, re, the experiences with the Satarsha rupture, you know, with truly heroic sheriffs driving, you know, sheriff uh, driving into the plume and pulling people out at his own personal great risk. You know, the fire department not knowing what they were going into at all, you know. And so we and when you talk about training, it ain't enough, folks. Training is not enough. You know, in most rural areas in the Midwest, these are volunteer fire departments. You know, they don't necessarily have the equipment that would be required to respond to these kind of ruptures. You know, it's gonna take money. It's gonna take resources to respond for them to, to, to gear up to be able to handle this response, you know? And so who's gonna pay for it? All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so, yep, next question over here. Um, Travis Hallam. I was the CO2 pipeline emergency response coordinator and trainer. So we'd go to all these communities, get them trained up, explain to them how to respond. But one of the recommendations I say you should use is Jessica pointed on earlier, not all pipelines are driven the same. Some are monetarily driven, some are safety driven. I was fortunate enough to work with Dakota Gas, extremely safety driven. We didn't meet the Femsville rules, that's baseline. We went far beyond that. So we had a reverse 911 system to notify everybody along that corridor. We trained all the response groups along that 205 mile corridor. They've already set the standard. All you've got to do is look at what some of those groups are doing that are out front and make that the standard. Don't create a minimum that's a baseline. Bring something up that's responsible and proven to, to work correctly. And as far as the hydrology, we see that too often. 
where these groups are just trenching, you know, make them do the HDD boring in areas of, uh, you know, difficult terrain. It, it's not as difficult as what's being made here. We have groups that are safety driven, follow that path and make that the standard. And I believe you're talking about the Source Valley pipeline. Uh, Dakota gasification pipeline, yeah, that yeah. goes from Beulah up into Estevan. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for example, one of the lack of integrities. Well, you know, Summit is arguing and the industry is arguing in Iowa right now that they can't disclose their emergency response plans because this is considered secret. Yet, they filed emergency response plans in North Dakota and Minnesota. And you can get the Source Valley emergency response plans online, probably because Canada requires them to be disclosed. But, you know, so we've got the industry saying one thing in one state and other things in other states. And the citizens look at all this and say, this is just baloney. You it, know? it is baloney because we did it. We were out front with ours. We'd have public meetings. We did it. And this wasn't recent. This is well over 20 some years ago. Right. And it's sort of the model I've used for the success within our boundaries is build it the right way, hold them accountable to, to being safety driven, not monetarily driven. And, and it's not as difficult. Take a successful operator and use their model. All right, I think we have time for one more, but I'll uh, preface a short one. Uh, so whoever is going to answer it, try and keep it concise. Uh, I do encourage you to uh, try and find any of our speakers, presenters afterwards um, and try and, you know, get more answers to your questions. But uh, let's do in the back there. Hi, my name is Jane Kleb. I started the group Bold Nebraska. We first took on Keystone XL and have helped other communities stop pipelines in their communities. We've now branched out to the Bold Alliance. Paul works with us. We're specifically working with farmers and ranchers with easement action teams in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and soon other states as well. There's just so much misinformation that the carbon pipeline companies are giving to states and counties and landowners. And it is really an area where I'm specifically looking at you, Max, where we need FIMSA to step in. You have carbon, I, I've sit through these hearings. I go to county board meetings. This is personal firsthand knowledge. Carbon pipeline companies are telling county commissioners as they're trying to create rules because they don't have any rules on the books for carbon pipelines. In Nebraska, we don't even have a state routing rule that applies to carbon pipelines. When we did a routing rule for Keystone XL, it only applies to oil pipelines. So we're being asked to potentially take four maximum pressure carbon pipelines in our state without any state or county regulations. That is terrifying for landowners who have this land in their family for over 100 years. And tribes, including the Winnebago tribe, all the tribes in Nebraska have passed a resolution against these pipelines. So we need FIMSA to be very clear and very specific about what states and counties can and cannot do. Because the carbon pipeline companies are coming in and telling them they can't do anything. That it's all federally preempted because of safety. And we've been down this road before. They're telling counties that it's no different than when you open up a can of soda water and you get that tingling feeling on your tongue. That's what would happen if an, if an explosion happens. That's what they're telling counties in formal proceedings. So you may pretend up there that there's a long list of things that carbon pipeline companies have to abide by, but that's not what we're facing on the ground. And I do think that a moratorium should be put in place until these regulations in counties and states are prepared to deal with them. And if the governments aren't gonna step in, then the citizens will. We have lots of lawyers. We can raise lots of money. We will tie you up in court for a long time. Max, do you wanna to touch on that very briefly? Yeah, well, I would just say, I hear some interesting things about misinformation out there as well. So I, I will say, if someone's trying to speak for FEMSA and it's not FEMSA, I would say, come to one of us and say, hey, we're hearing this. Um, Early on, me and my uh, some of my legal folks, uh, Iowa Office of Consumer Advocate, reached out to us early in the process. Uh, we have community liaisons, a bunch are here. Um, feel free to reach out to them as well because, yeah, when I hear that too, that FEMSA said this and there's no FEMSA individual in the chain, please do come to us. We're limited on how far we can jump into their process, but if it's something you wanna get clarification on information, please reach out to us. Uh, me personally, feel free. Again, we have community liaisons. 
um, that are all uh, looking at this as well. And we'll try to, as much as we can, figure out what is at least the true facts behind what they're saying or not saying. So at least I think we could commit to that. We just jumping into the processes we may not be able to, but hopefully that helps a little bit. So I wish that we could take more questions. I, um, I, I just, yeah. I need to respond to, can Go I? ahead, Dan. Yeah, this, very this quickly. Um, Hello? How about now? Okay. Uh, just a couple of things. One was, I totally agree with Jane, who uh, I've been to a lot of those meetings. I've spent some time, quite a bit of time recently in Iowa and other places out there. Um, what's happening on the ground is a, it's, a, it's a, an absolute propaganda fest. It really is. Um, facts have been altered, you know, about all sorts of things historically that happened, like Sartarsha. Um, other things are overvalued, like the record of 5,000 miles of pipeline indicating much of anything. I mean, that's a very small amount of pipelines compared to the petroleum system. And as Paul mentioned, they're in places where there are no high consequence areas, pretty much. The other thing I was wanted to say, just to correct the record, and pardon me if it seems petty, but I have to respond to Max here. There were overnight hospitalizations. Denbury admitted that in their 48-hour report to the NRC. They later tried to walk that back and say there may have been one and it was unrelated, but that's not true. And we, are, we have the facts on that. If, uh, if Pahimps is interested in seeing more on that, we'll, we'll dig it out. But I, I, I've been hearing that way too much. Uh, it's not true. People spent time in the hospital. Some of them are there for over a week. Um, and, uh, you know, that has to be pushed back against because that really trivializes what happened. Thanks. Um, there we go. All right. So thank you to all of our panelists. We really appreciate it. And I know we didn't cover probably everything that everyone wanted. But like I said, um, find the panelists afterwards and hopefully uh, they can have some more answers for you. So thank you, everyone. On to the next panel. I launched your uh, webinar that we did. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, quick. Good job. Thanks. Yeah. What? To another one. That's right. Oh, it should be up there. Yeah. Well, and. In the case of Debray and some others, we have the hospital, we have records. They, they're the attorney. Uh, they where are they? Uh, and we'll have continuing access. Trying to find my Hopefully thing. This won't be down to a matter of, it won't come down to a matter of personal. The records. next panel in this room is a NAPSER overview and initiatives. And the panel downstairs is talking to the FERC's Office of Public Participation. Is there, a, is there a clicker or are they, is someone else advancing slides? Oh, is that this? Okay, I just didn't want to push buttons that I didn't know what they did. Okay.
I should be able to work to get this in a half an hour. I'll have my stopwatch on. Okay. We're going to try... We're gonna try and get started soon if you all can find seats. We'll get through these last two panels and then feed you again. Okay, if y'all can find seats, my name's Rebecca Craven. I'm gonna introduce our next speaker who's here to talk about uh, what napser has been up to and what they're uh, looking forward to working on in the near future um, to tell us uh, what Napster's new initiatives are is Jonathan Wolfgram. He's the chair of Napster and uh, deputy director of the Minnesota Office of Public Safety. Morning, everybody. I'm the speaker that's between you and lunch. Don't they always say that's not a good spot to be? Well, I got, I'm going to set my stopwatch, do my best to get you on to what's probably will turn out to be an excellent lunch. So a little bit about Napster. I remember the first time that I Googled Napster. We are not the National Association of Power Skateboard Racing. So that sounds like a fun meeting, too. But I am the national chair um, as of a couple months ago, uh, following in, in Mary Friend's footsteps that are, that's back there. So I'll be giving you a little bit of an overview today about Napster as a whole. I'll also be putting on my hat occasionally as the deputy director of the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety to give you a little bit of state perspective. So a little bit about Napster as an you know, entity. We were created in 1982 as kind of the national voice or the group of all the pipeline state regulators, some of which are represented here today. We represent 52 different pipeline agencies. There might even be a couple different agencies in a particular state, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. We are about 75% of the total regulatory workforce in the U.S. So the states and FIMS are both kind of you know, functioning in that space where we do pipeline safety regulatory work, doing inspections, doing investigations and such with our respective pipelines. We have oversight of over 2.8 million miles of pipeline. A lot of that being the distribution pipeline that you know each of us probably has a gas meter or something like that at your apartment building or the home in which you live. And I'll read our mission statement. It's kind of at the bottom and maybe a little hard to read, but we strive to strengthen state pipeline safety programs through the promotion of improved pipeline safety standards, education, training, and technology. And I hope I can give you a little bit more of how we carry that mission out as an organization. A little bit about me. I really like that QR code thing. I think I'm going to steal that for our pipeline safety seminar. But I am an engineer uh, kind of by trade, uh, graduate of North Dakota State University of Construction Engineering. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Minnesota. Prior to working in this pipeline safety world, I was working on buildings in the structures world. I'm, again, I'm the work for the Minnesota Office of Pipeline Safety as our deputy director. So kind of you know managing the day-to-day -day work of what our inspection staff does. First, I'll start off just kind of talking a little bit about some relationships. First being the relationship between Napster and the Pipeline Safety Trust. Obviously, uh, having Napster here today, it's a, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to get here and speak with you all today. This is my first PST conference. How many people, this is your first? So we have a couple here as well, so we're all kind of new. So I'm really enjoying the, the dialogue that's going on today. So obviously, we have the opportunity to have discussions in a conference setting. There's always those really good conference settings or those, those conference conversations you can have at lunch or you know after dinner or something like that. So I encourage you all to kind of lean into those as well. We're involved in you know with committees with one another, obviously uh, things like the Liquid Pipeline Advisory Committee, the Gas Pipeline Advisory Committee, both having NAPSER and PST representatives. Um, and obviously we kind of participate in the transparency reviews that if you hop on the PST website, you can find a lot of information about the pipeline safety state programs, including kind of the deep dive that they do on our websites. I know for the state of Minnesota, we were able to make some really good enhancements to our website just to make it more transparent, to hopefully make it more usable to all the, the pipeline safety you know, interest parties that are out there. 
obviously well, that 2.8 million miles can be sliced and diced in a lot of different ways. The first being really that that gas transmission and, and gas distribution pipeline. I'll dig into a couple different maps I think that are interesting in the next couple of slides. Um, as Max kind of talked about in his last uh, session, you know, some of us have hazardous liquid programs. I know in our state we have intrastate, you know, hazardous liquid that we have oversight of. We have LNG, you know, propane gas systems, underground storage, uh, you know, facilities that we regulate. And a number of states also collaborate with uh, FIMSA as interstate agents, where, you know, particularly in our state, we act as an interstate agent where we work with FIMSA to conduct interstate inspections on gas and liquid. And also we wear hats kind of in the damage prevention world as well. Not only pipeline safety damage prevention, but working with, you know, non pipeline infrastructure, telecom, sewer, water, and working with excavation contractors to make sure that everyone is safe when digging around underground utilities. Just kind of a couple maps here that we've been working to um, pull together. And I think this really highlights kind of our, first off, our, our region approach to what we do. We have five NAPSA regions. You'll find that all those regions, you know, kind of get together on, a, on an annual basis where they can talk about maybe you know concerns or things that they're working through at a region level maybe bubble up concerns to the the national meeting that we would have on an annual basis but this first slide just gives you kind of a snapshot of the count of the various operators that we have oversight of and i'll kind of proceed this with just kind of digging in a little deeper on the primarily on gas distribution assets where you can see these are the, the operator counts for private distribution companies that states regulate followed by municipally operated gas systems, basically where you'd have a city sewer and water kind of group also kind of wearing the hat as a pipeline operator in their respective city and kind of the NAPSA involvement of regulating those folks. LPG, uh, liquid propane, basically where you have those propane tanks that are feeding, you know, maybe a, a strip mall or having a, a hotel or something like that. And then gathering lines. This is data based on our progress reports that we submit to FIMS on an annual basis. And obviously with some of the recent gathering line changes, you'll probably see that map change over the course of time. But that's kind of, you know, at least 2021 stats. So in addition to that kind of pipeline safety regulatory work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, we're also involved in many committees, just like many of you, working with FIMSA, API, CGA, NARUC, GPAC, LPAC, where we're working through, you know, regulations, technologies, standards, best practices, trying to wrestle with if there's an you know, industry concern here, how do we, how do we work towards uh, you know, a viable improvement or a safety solution? Uh, you can find a listing of our committees listed on our website. Also talk a little bit about FIMSA and states. Uh, first really being the, the role that both FIMSA and states have in the regulatory work that we do. Obviously we have FIMSA acting kind of on the interstate pipeline uh, you know, realm of, you know, regulation of interstate gas and, and hazardous liquid pipelines. And we have the role of the states working primarily in that distribution world and kind of the respective expertises that we both bring to the table. Now, we also have rulemaking. Rulemaking can largely happen on the, the federal level that I think many folks are very familiar with. We also can have rulemaking that happens on the state level. So when we're talking about intrastate pipelines, states may adopt more stringent regulations for their respective intrastate assets. Um, we might also act, you know, and collaborate with FIMSA through that, that federal rulemaking process, just like many of you, you know, in industry or in the public um, through, you know, participation by, you know, comments and things like that that can be submitted. Though I would say that we are kind of different and the fact that ultimately we're going to be folks that are regulating those rules as well. We are largely funded uh, through FIMSA grant programs. I'll touch on that a little bit on my next slide. And then obviously we tag team with, with FIMSA as partners through working through technical issues with all of you as industry as well. And I, as I stated before, a number of folks are also acting as interstate agents where we're out doing those hazardous liquid and gas transmission interstate pipeline inspections. A little bit on the grant funding for states because I think this is kind of an interesting thing um, that you might not know about if, if this is new for you. So many states, as I stated, participate in FIMSA's grant program. These grant programs fund up to 80%, kind of on a reimbursement basis for the pipeline safety regulatory work we do. These gas or these grants are built into, you know, kind of the categories I have listed there where we have gas grants, liquid grants, storage grants, and damage prevention grants. These basically cover, you know, funding for not only the staff, but the tools, the equipment, maybe the rental space that we need for an office, the computers that we use. 
and they were kind of function on a, on a reimbursement basis on an annual process. Like any grants, there's a pretty good rule book that you have to follow. So much like the pipeline company has a reg book to follow, we have a big thick guideline book that we have to follow all the way down to, you know, qualifications for our inspection staff, intervals for inspections, inspection types, even to the point of what, how funds can be used. You can buy this, you can't buy that, those sorts of things. We participate in annual reporting. So you'll see some of those reporting metrics as I go through my presentation here today. And we also get inspected. So much like a pipeline company has their annual inspection by a regulator, we also get inspected on an annual basis. Where a FIMSA inspector will come out, they'll look at our processes for inspections, they'll look at our procedures, they'll look at the training and qualifications of our staff, and they'll just check up on, you know, are you following your statutes? Are you following your own internal processes and procedures? And they make recommendations. And if you get to the point where you're not following the rules, it can ultimately loss, you know, result in a loss of grant funding for the state. Now I'll kind of dive a little bit into the role of states. So I'll, I'll put my, my pipeline safety hat on and talk a little bit about what we do as a state. And I think you'll find that, you know, the first couple of bullets I have there, you're going to find that's very similar across all the states where we're all doing education. We're doing education in the form of you know, pipeline safety conferences on an annual basis where we collaborate with our, our pipeline companies. We're training them. They're training us on maybe some new things that they're doing. We provide education to the public in the form of maybe we're talking about damage prevention. Maybe we're talking about CO2 pipelines. Maybe we're talking about renewable natural gas. Maybe we're talking about how pipelines are constructed. What's the regulatory process look like? We're talking with other government officials. Not everybody out there understands the, the complexity of the pipeline industry and the regulations that apply. We all could conduct inspections of our pipeline companies. So we might be familiar with what the reg book is, we need the operator to understand what's in that reg book, and we also need to go and verify that they're following what's in that regulatory framework for them. When we need to, we utilize our enforcement processes in our respective states to address non-compliances of those regulations. And then when something bad happens, we're out there doing investigations. So we're sending folks out, you know, in the event of an accident, a spill, a fire, or an explosion, an injury, or a fatality, where we're focusing, you know, on people, property, and the environment. And a big takeaway that as you know, I spend more time in Napser, you really begin to appreciate how every state is different. And I'll touch on that a little bit here in my next slide. The first place that you might see is, is staffing. You might have some programs that have very many people. You might have some programs that maybe have one or two. All is contingent on the amount of infrastructure that they have in their state. A lot of this can really go to the amount of oversight that that particular state has. You might have some states that have gas and liquid programs. You might have some states that maybe they don't have statutory authority over LPG. Maybe they don't have an LNG plant. So really, it's kind of contingent on what is, you know, what is the charge in the state statute of what that agency is spun up to do. You'd even find differences in where that specific regulatory body resides. Many of our members at NAPSA are part of their Public Utilities Commission, where they're not only focused on the pipeline safety world, they're also kind of focused on those rates. Maybe they're even involved in some of the routing and siting. I know for our agency, we're part of the Department of Public Safety. So we're not really involved in any routing, permitting, or rate setting at all, strictly looking at pipeline safety compliance. Another place that you might find differences is the regulations. As I stated earlier, some states may have additional regulatory requirements for their intrastate assets. I know in Minnesota, we have some more stringent reporting requirements that apply to our intrastate assets. Funding, that's always kind of a big one and you start looking at how every pipeline safety program is funded, it's probably unique across every single state. Some get general fund appropriations, some have user fees like we have in our states, some are really heavily dependent on those grant uh, amounts that we get from FIMSA. We have a compendium document on our website that you can be able to kind of dig into some of these things a little bit more if you're interested, and I've provided that link. And I believe all these presentations will be online too, so you should be able to find that and click on some of these links if you have additional questions. I'll talk a little bit about kind of what the inspection process looks like. How many people have been part of a pipeline inspection? We have a couple of people, right? A couple, a couple. How many people have not? probably all the rest of you, right? So hopefully I can give you a little bit of insight to, to what, what that looks like. But kind of in any safety framework, you have inspections, right? You have the company doing inspections. You know, we talked a lot about, we heard a lot about the aviation world. 
they're doing inspections you know throughout their process you have your pre-flight inspections we serve as kind of another layer of inspections to what the operator is doing kind of through the regulatory compliance lens so whether it's a person from minnesota it's somebody from west virginia it's somebody from california they're going to send out an inspector they're going to look at maybe the plans and procedures that an operator has for, for maintenance, for emergency response. We're gonna look at their procedures. We're gonna verify that those are in compliance with the regs that apply to that particular asset. We're gonna look at the training and qualifications. So if, if you're not very familiar with the regs, there are some very specific training and qualification requirements in the regulations. If you're gonna operate this valve, if you're gonna take this reading, if you're gonna do this survey, you have to be qualified. There's procedures that have to be followed. And we're gonna check and verify that the personnel that's doing the work is trained and qualified. We're also gonna send staff out to those assets. So if it's a reg station, it's a pump, it's a tank, there's gonna be an inspector that's gonna go through and inspect that as well. Make sure that it's operated and maintained per the code, per the procedures, as well as you know making sure that, is it being maintained? Is the operator giving it the love that it needs to make sure that it lasts and make sure that it's safe? I talked a little bit about some of our inspection uh, work. I talked a little bit about some of the grant requirements have we have. One of those is reporting. So we have a metric that's maybe kind of a weird metric, but it's called an inspection day. That's basically where we're sending out uh, an inspector to do some sort of inspection. They're out there working with the operator, looking at their records, processes, procedures. And each inspector under the grant program has to accrue 85 days you know, per year. That's kind of the quota that they need to reach at a minimum. So we break those into buckets on our reports on an annual basis. And I've tried to just roll those up to give you a snapshot of just the work that Napster does, at least you know, 2021. But I'd say most of the time, this is, these are probably pretty consistent numbers. So there's over 54,000 inspection days that were accrued by Napster inspectors in 2021. So that's about 642 FTE if you do the math on it. We break those up into buckets. So if you're looking at that standard comprehensive number, that's kind of the routine O&M inspections. That's going out to reg stations. That's looking at uh, plans, processes, and procedures. There are nearly 30,000 um, inspection days in that area. Design, construction, and testing. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's when inspectors are going out, looking at new services or new main, looking at the fusion of pipe, looking at pipe being welded, lowered in the ditch, kind of all those different aspects there. Integrity management, looking at those DIMP plans, those transmission integrity management plans. OQ or operator qualification. Again, that's kind of where we're looking at the training and qualification plans for the operator personnel. And then damage prevention. Now that's strictly you know, pipeline safety damage prevention. That doesn't include the, the telecom damage prevention work that we do or the you know, outreach and education we're doing with excavation companies as well. Sometimes you find stuff on inspections. So then that's where the state has to utilize its enforcement process. This is a snapshot of what was identified in 2021 by the states. So nearly 12,000 pipeline safety violations were identified. And with that, we have uh, you know, requirements in our guidelines that we need to take a compliance action. So that's basically going through, that's notifying the operator of the violation, issuing a compliance order on how to remedy that violation and basically getting that to the operator in writing. Now, sometimes civil penalties are issued. There's not a civil penalty that's issued for every violation. Sometimes it's just, we need some work on this thing. There's a gap, you know, please work to adjust that. Sometimes there's things that, you know, warrant a civil penalty. Maybe it's something that's been happening for a while. Maybe it's a repeat violation, or maybe it resulted in something that had some pretty serious consequences. And that's where the, the civil penalty uh, amount there is, is utilized. Bear in mind that sometimes some of these violations can carry from one year to another. So it's not always just something that happened in that particular year. You might have rollover things. Maybe we find something today, probably won't have it closed out and rectified until you know, maybe this time next year. A little bit on investigations. So again, when there's a failure, if there's a spill, if there's a release of product, you know, where we have you know, a line hit or something like that, an inspector is going out and conducting an inspection. I think you'd find that most of our pipeline safety programs, they have an on-call person that in the event of an accident or a, 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 you know, an incident, that they're being notified by the pipeline company to go out and conduct an investigation. The first thing that we're going to do is ensure that the operator is making the area safe, right? So making sure that how do we minimize that release of product, stop the flow of gas, 
If there's a house with gas in it, how do we you know, get the house vented and the electric pulled from that house so we don't have an explosion? So those are kind of the, the that's what the first lens or the first cut of things that we work with a, a company on. After the area is made safe, then we really want to dig in to see why did this accident happen? How do we make it not happen again? Right. And then we want to do that, the lessons learned and and move those things through things like our naps or meetings or, you know, forums such as this, where, you know, when we have those takeaways and follow up to an accident, we really want to make sure that we can use it to prevent that from happening again. And obviously, if there are, you know, violations, that, that's kind of the, the final thing that we look through. But certainly looking through compliance as well. This is just kind of an additional piece there of how many inspection days were accrued in the last year by the states just in follow-up to accidents and incidents. Bearing in mind that some states might have some more stringent criteria. When I'm talking accidents and incidents, largely that kind of falls into the regulatory framework that the operators have to follow. Reportable accidents, as we would call them, through the FIMSA lens. But you know, I, I know our state would have some additional reporting requirements that would have to be followed. As I wrap up, I'll leave a little space for, for um, discussion if anyone has questions. But kind of as we, you know, I've given you a, hopefully a good snapshot of you know NAPS are you know a very high level, a little more of a snapshot of what states do, and give you a little you know insight here as to what we're thinking about. So I talked a little bit about rulemaking and just kind of that unique perspective that we have as states, where we're not only the folks that can comment, you know, much like the public, much like the the operators, we can provide that that comment. We're the people that at the end of the day also have to apply those regulations, enforce them and inspect for them at the end of the day. So I think that certainly that highlights, you know, some interest where we really want to try to be, you know, in that regulatory making process as much as possible to the extent we can to really understand why the regs are being made. What are the expectations of how those regs are going to come into play? How do they work? Funding is another big area of, of concern. Um, I talked earlier about how current you know, grant guidelines provide up to 80% funding for estates. We've been more in the realm of the high you know, 60s, middle 60s, as far as a percent reimbursement the last couple of years. So really looking at the additional cost of things, you know, I think everybody's probably feeling that right now. Stuff costs a lot more than it did, right, a couple of years ago. So looking at those increase in costs, as well as looking at the increase in regulatory requirements, we really want to make sure that we can maximize the amount of funding available to states to do the pipeline safety work that we do. We've talked a lot about RNG, hydrogen, and CO2. Those are all things that I think the comment was made. This is all kind of you know new territory for lots of us to, to tread. So we really want to make sure that we're getting as educated as possible and really understanding how are these projects going to work, what regulations apply to them. We want to, to the extent possible, really work to streamline our grant processes and our inspection processes to really you know, fully utilize an inspector to make sure that they can go out and do their work efficiently and really utilize the operator's time efficiently as well. Occasionally, we will issue resolutions to FIMSA in areas where we see that regulations maybe need to be changed or clarified. You can find a listing of our resolutions on our website as well. Couple of the, again, I already talked about this a little bit, but took a little survey just in prep for this presentation, just to give you an idea of what the lay of the land looks like as far as RNG, hydrogen, and CO2, at least for, through NAPS or member lenses of people that are seeing these projects come on their radar. And, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna be faced with regulating these or answering questions about them. So you can see we have about 21 states that have RNG projects, you know, existing or you know, coming up soon. We have hydrogen injection. I know six states have proposed projects in that space, as well as the you know six states with proposed CO2 projects. And being the state of Minnesota, we have all three of those things. So lots of new things to, to kind of tackle as a regulatory agency. Again, looking ahead to staffing increases. Uh, that was another thing you know, I was trying to gauge from our membership. You know, as we look forward, what does it look like for staffing? Uh, with increased regulations, damage prevention, um, you know, activities that we carry out as a state, the increase in gathering line regulations, the forecast of retirements or attrition, and increased regulatory oversight. I think you know that's a pretty fair statement that we you know we see that we need to grow our state inspection staff to kind of tackle these things as we move forward. 
I hope that gives you a good overview of what we do as a National Association of Pipeline Safety Representatives. I am glad to be here today and certainly, you know, welcome any questions anyone might have and certainly be happy to chat with you after I'm done here with the session. Any questions? Yes. From the state perspective, what do you feel is the biggest challenge to the states in being able to effectively fulfill your mission? The question was just kind of, a, you know, what are the challenges to us being effective? I think there's a couple of things, you know, when we look at um, one being staffing. You know, I think as, as a, you know, an association or an organization, you know, different states have different staffing needs. Um, certainly hiring, you know, qualified staff, I think right now is, is a challenge. And I think that sounds like that's kind of a challenge for many people. Um, certainly there can be challenges with just those state statutes and how your state adopts regulations um, and how you bring those into the fold. Some states automatically adopt regulations. Others have kind of a more complicated process to get those regulations into their mix. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, I just wondered, uh, oh, okay. <clears throat> I don't really need this, but thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, what, is the, what are the safety concerns that are relevant to uh, sequestering or whatever, burying hydrogen? There is, are there, is there a set of, of uh, concerns there or constraints on how that can be handled due to safety? Sure. The question is regarding just the safety of hydrogen. I think primarily uh, what we're seeing a lot of at the state level is kind of that hydrogen injection process. And we do currently have regulations that, you know, through our Part 192 regs that would apply. But I think we have a lot of new things that we don't know about with hyd you know, hydrogen. When we're injecting hydrogen into steel pipelines, that could potentially re result in crack propagation. Uh, we have some other things where, you know, if we're talking about emergency response, well, we don't just have the normal natural gas we might be used to, right? We have kind of mixed in another flammable gas, hydrogen, into that. So there's some things like that that I think, you know, there is more study that is needed. There's more study that's, you know, currently working in that, that space just to understand some of those concerns. Another good question. Any Hello. Other? Thank you. My name is Maury Johnson. I'm an impact Atlanta on a natural gas pipeline in southern West Virginia. Uh, I'm like many, many landowners from all this country. I don't want to be here, but I got drugged into this conversation. Um, whether you're talking about hydrogen or CO2 or natural gas or oil, uh, the way that landowners across this country, and I have talked to hundreds, literally hundreds of them in New Jersey, New York, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, all over this country, uh, we're, as Jane said, we're being fed an obvious line of BS. Uh, it's absurd, some of the things I've heard here today. In what reality would you say that you can't consider safety issues when citing a pipeline of any kind? Our children and our grandchildren are the ones being put at risk. I see a pipeline, a highly explosive 42-inch fat gas pipeline put in a high impact area beside of a brand new title one school i mean beside of it that is insane so i hope that the femsa and our government will follow the constitution ensure the safety and security of the american people it doesn't say anything about safe doing the safety of the and the security of the corporations i know this is not going to make people happy i was just reading a, a report from the explosion of the Columbia pipeline in West Virginia about 10 years ago. That's about two hours from my home. And they released a report and it, uh, just a short thing said that it had that pipeline hadn't been really inspected. I heard it hadn't been inspected for 20 years, but you go to the NTSB report and there's no details. So you need to gain the trust of the American people if you're not going to continue to have oppositions to these kinds of things. So I hope that we get in a serious conversation about safety in this country. How many mask casualty events are we going to take before we do that? 
Uh, I think those are good, are good comments, certainly through that, that element of trust. And I think that's where we have things like, you know, forums where we can hopefully discuss some of these things in the open. We have things that, that you know, about transparency. I, I think hopefully that the more information we can share from what we do as regulatory bodies can give you more insight to what we do. I think also education is a big piece where, you know, many of us in the room, it's kind of our day-to-day -day job, right? Where we, you know, we, we live it, we breathe it, we're working with it. And sometimes we forget that, yeah, there's people out there that we do need to engage with. We do need to educate them on some of these things. So I think hopefully, you know, we can, that's where I think, you know, comments like that, we can take those and hopefully make us dig in a little bit more on, on trying to educate folks that, you know, might not be in the know. Thank you. All right. Hello, uh, Dante Swinton, uh, Center for International Environmental Law. Uh, so in one of your slides, you gave information on the number of violations in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Sure. Uh, when you actually calculate out that $6.34 million, it ends up being about $500 per violation, which is almost literally nothing. So I'm curious how uh, Napster and FEMSA are actually going to make these various states, uh, various companies that are uh, responsible for these violations actually held accountable if they're barely being charged for any of them, if at all. So I, I would like some greater clarity on how sure. Napster wants to move forward with that to make sure they actually are paid attention to, especially with the interest in grading, uh, increasing interest in building out hydrogen uh, blend uh, pipelines as well as uh, additional CO2 pipelines. Sure. I think that's an excellent question. I'll try to go back to that slide here if I can, if it'll do it. There we go. I think an important thing to point out is not every, and I can really speak very intelligently, hopefully for Minnesota, where not every violation we issue gets a civil penalty involved with it. Right. So there might be something where an operator missed a an interval on, you know, in an inspection. You know, that might not necessarily be something that gets a, a civil penalty. Now, if we find lots of intervals were missed and we've identified this multiple years in a row, that's obviously where we're going to ratchet up the civil penalties. Some of those state statutory provisions that apply for a specific state also might, you know, kind of drive what enforcement looks like. And as far as the dollar amount that some of those states can can utilize as well, I think typically what you'll find is, you know, at least for our state, that we're going to issue higher civil penalties based on consequences, based on accidents, and based on off of history. You know, we have all those kind of you know things highlighted in our statute that you know charge us to hey, if there's something that's egregious and it keeps happening, that's where you need to utilize the higher amounts. Is there a cap on that? Do you have a cap on what you can? Yes, we have in our state, we have 100,000 per day per violation with a million dollar cap. Some might have, you know, similar to what FIMSA has, the 200,000 per day with a 2 million cap. But that can really vary all across the board for the states. Good questions. Any other questions? I'll be sticking around up front. If anybody has any further questions, be happy to chat with you. Thanks, everybody. Here. You want to use this one? Yeah. I think it's still on. We're off to lunch. There should be hotel staff um, as you go out the door and down the first uh, stairs right there, directing you to um, the location for lunch. It's uh, if you've been to any of the breakout room sessions that. Um, you're partway there if you've gone there, and there'll they'll be uh, staff along the way to show you the way. Thanks, everybody.
Hey, uh, hey, one of them all, uh, one of them all under that table back there. Give me your knee. I need one, two, two up. Got you, man. I'm about to go get some. Huh? You're right next door. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Uh, they right on.
Yeah, he's so used to working with, uh, with Wally. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to talk about. Him. I'm just talking about like if he probably work with me or you. He, he, you know. Be a willing to need a thing. Right. <laughs> he said she quit, but I hope she ain't quit. Who? Lashana. Yeah, if you say that so good, I think you're just saying. He's just saying that shit. Lashana needs this job. Yeah. You gotta tell us, baby. You know. They ain't got more pads over there. Huh? Oh, you, you got. Know, we, uh, just make sure we got these straight out the window. Yeah, I need a pad up here. Yeah, make sure you get a pad up there. Look at that car right there, bro. Look at that car right there. I know that. Uh, I just brought some to put some on, put some more up there. So. Yeah, he said, just like this right here, paint them pads on there. He said, don't worry about that. I'll be coming back. Yeah, I, I, he I, I told him. him. Yeah.
then the one what is the one that's the one that ain't touched yet. Good.
I was one of the first to vote. Yeah. Yeah. Not who I thought you were. I thought you were somebody else. <laughs>